Where's Reed? I can take a roll if you need to, Jeff. Um, yes, please. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali. Uh, is Robert Young here? Here. here. Thank you. And Bill Grau. Here. Uh, Bonnie Luisi. I'm here. Hello. Uh, Susan I'm Miller. Here. Susan's here. Hello. Susan Ricky Smith. Good afternoon. Yes. Hello. Uh, JJ Schofield. I'm here. JJ. Uh, Reed. I'm here. Reed. Bob Stewart. I'm here. Good. Hello. And we got Tom. So we got everybody. Fantastic. Well, welcome everybody. And with that, I will officially open the November 3rd meeting of the Oregon Educators Benefit Board. Welcome. Jeff, can you speak up? Speak up? Yeah. You're, so it's pretty. On this? <clears throat> so, welcome to the November 3rd meeting of the Oregon Educators Benefit Board. Um, to our new normal 2.0 with pictures. And the first agenda item is uh, approval of the October 6 meeting synopsis. This JJ moved to approve. Three and I second. Thank you. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sounds like the majority to me. OK, first up, um, provider diversity and access. Um, with Kaiser being the um, lead off presenter. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, uh, I think we have Hi. a team presenting today, and I think Sapari is going to pull up the um, uh, slides on her computer. I'm getting it. Well, we have a great uh, group of presenters today. Um, Sapari and I will be only making a few comments, and we have um, uh, Gwen from excuse me Gwen Turner from our um, Northwest Permanente uh, will be presenting and she's an expert on uh, equity inclusion and diversity we'll also Michelle Teeples who's one of our practice managers uh, uh, directors at mental health who's been very involved in improving thinking through and working through issues around how we can uh, develop a broader team of um, uh, mental health specialists and therapists uh, for uh, our members, which uh, are across the spectrum of uh, race, and race, ethnicity, uh, and other concerns. Um, and so we will be going through at the end. We'll be, I'll have a few comments um, about our work in terms of uh, social determinants of health uh, and where that's standing and where we're moving with that. But that's really a much longer conversation uh, that we could have in much more detail later on. Uh, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, move to the next slide. Sorry, Dr. Martin. This is the part. Can you can you see the slides? I can see the slide, but yep, it's filling go. up only. The slide is only filling up a, a third of my screen. Is there a way to get rid of all the other? There we go. Perfect. There we go. Thanks. You got it. OK, yep, thank yep. you. We're good now. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Buckman. I think, sorry, you introduced everyone. Um, I will get on to the next slide. So um, just wanted to let you know that um, our efforts to provide equitable, inclusive, and diverse care for our community starts at the highest level of leadership at Kaiser Permanente. And while this has always been an important commitment for our organization, um, re referencing this quote from Greg Adams, who is the chairman and CEO of Ch Kaiser Permanente, he states that we must and will continue to do better. 
So you will see in our upcoming slides that we have made significant progress. However, our journey does not end as we continue to strengthen our care delivery to our members. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Tiefel, who will talk about how we support our members in finding their provider of choice. Michelle? All right, thank you, Sapari. So I'm down here in the bottom of your box. Hopefully I've flexed into your screen somewhat. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a couple of topics about finding your provider, how mental health supports aligning the right care, and what if we have a gap um, in what the member's looking for related to race, ethnicity, faith, sexuality, and how do we really support that? And then I'm going to close with a little bit of what, um, what we're working on. I do know there were a few, maybe a few of you that were on a previous presentation a few days ago um, and have some questions that are out there waiting to be answered. Um, I don't know if I'm going to address them today in my topics, but I, I promise you um, we are working on those answers with Dr. Somasetti and Dr. Liang, and we'll be getting those back to you shortly. So starting at the top of this slide here, we're really talking about finding a provider. So I think it's important to know that not just for the mental health and addiction medicine department, but with inside KP, we have a provider portal. So the kp.org provider directory does show our bios, our photos, our language, our gender, and our culturally specific care. One of the things that has been not only in meetings like this, but other places, even within our own departments talked about, is really, is there a field to search for by ethnicity? And the answer to that is, um, we don't require employees to self-identify on the basis of race. So that's why we offer all of the other ways to search um, based on gender, language spoken, um, and then of course offer bios and photos for members to, to look through. Um, our member relations team can always be of assistance. Um, so the 800 number on the back of the card, um, the folks that are there at our member um, services center can also help to panel and walk through um, different providers that folks are looking for, as well as any of our patient access specialists at our call center. So um, I do want to pause for a moment before I kind of flip down to just the mental health section um, and really highlight some of the centers of excellence and programming that we've expanded on over the years at KP. So KP did a few years ago open up what we call our Gender Pathways Clinic to support our LGBTQIA 2S plus members. And this amazing group of professionals consists of social workers, physicians, and a nursing team that provide gender-affirming support and care for our members, and also are closely partnered with our OHSU team. So, and similar to that kind of carve-out and that specialty-focused culturally specific care, we also offer our Latinx modules, or our Centers of Excellence. Um, I actually, prior to my experience in mental health, had a big hand in helping to set up the Latinx modules. Uh, oh gosh, more than five or six years ago. Um, it was really exciting to see it start down in the Mid Valley and really spread across the region. Um, and it really does meet the cultural and language needs of our members. Um, but just wanted to highlight a few ways that KP is really trying to hone in around that culturally competent care um, and how we're providing it um, in this space within our care delivery system. So now specifically to mental health um, focused on provider diversity. So the three bullet points here around triaging, cultural competency, and then opportunities around virtual care. So first and foremost, the most important thing um, to know about seeking specialty mental health support is that members are required to go through a triage process or a, basically a first contact with our mental health team. So this is a team of licensed professional therapists that um, are on the phone and asking the member a series of questions to be able to, to align them with what their needs are within that of specialty mental health. So the member will go through a series of questions, which also includes being screened by, um, we use a lay tool called the Columbia Suicide um, Severity Rating Tool. So this helps us understand the urgency of the patient. Um, it, it helps us kind of tease out the imminent danger to themselves or others and access to lethal means. The importance of this is, is that we want to make sure that it's the right care at the right time in the right place. So if somebody did screen urgent or emergent, we would have next steps and a protocol in place to be able to catch them and support them or direct them um, or get support and help to them. Um, the same as we would somebody who screens maybe um, more on a routine basis and not as urgent or emergent as, as previously mentioned. Um, so we have a place for all of our members to land. So during this time, though, I do want to call out that we do ask our members if they have specific needs or would like to identify with a specific type of provider. 
So again, really hoping that the member at that point is asking for someone that looks like them, has their lived experience, um, practices similar faith, or has you know any experience around the sexuality or gender affirming um, needs that they have. So we do encourage our members to go um, at the end of that visit to look through that provider directory that I just mentioned um, to be able to get a good goodness of fit is what we call it um, and make sure that they're best aligned um, to help you know get, get them where they're going the first time instead of having to have them come back and go through a series of um, additional ticketing questions and, and processes there. I do want to call out that the mission of Kaiser Permanente Institute for Culturally Competent Care is really to incorporate the concept of culturally competent care into our healthcare delivery system. So when I'm talking about this, it's not specific to mental health. It actually spans our entire KP Northwest region um, and, and our sister, our, uh, sister uh, regions as well. So we do a lot of facilitating um, the training of providers and staff. We do provide periodic assessments of member needs and always making sure the member voice is in the mix of it through patient advisory councils, um, through customer, member complaints or concerns. We use those to help improve the delivery system that we have. Developing cultural competence measurement tools and of course disseminating best practices throughout Kaiser Permanente. And before we go to the next slide, Safari, I wanted to touch on virtual care. So the telemedicine within um, KP Northwest looks a little bit different if any of you have access to your primary care provider or your specialist. Um, our new COVID normal is really very highly virtual in these days. Um, specific to mental health though, I do wanna call out, it was very new for us. In a matter of two days, we flipped our entire department virtual to 100%. We were about roughly 20% virtual before that. Um, and so it was something very new for our providers. We currently are still hovering somewhere between like the 90% virtual, um, depending on uh, what part of mental health you're accessing. Um, but what I can say is that is exciting about this is that it's forced us to have to get outside of our bubble of you come to us. It's really us coming to you in your car, in that safe space that you can find in between your children napping or snack time. It's really trying to meet our members where they are and really pulling them into our groups and our sessions and making it more convenient. So this is an area of growth for the mental health department. Primary care has been doing this a bit longer than us, um, but the mental health and addiction department are fully committed to wrapping around our members in that way. We do have a little ways to go, but we, we are on the right path. Sapari, so can you take me to the next slide? I will, thanks Michelle. And also just wanted to add that our next presentation or next subject on the agenda is telehealth where we will be able to show you some of the, the data behind that. Okay, great. All right, so just checking on down here, um, a lot of the process to requesting providers um, out of network um, based on race or ethnicity, something that the member identifies up front, um, there's kind of a process to it. And I think it's important for folks to know um, how, we, how our algorithm is inside of KP. Um, and really it is, we always start with accessing KP first. So many of you know that our service area spans Longview to Eugene, and then of course, east and west of the I-5 corridor. Within that geographic area, we have psychiatry, we have therapy, gero psych, gender pathways, addiction medicine, residential treatments, intensive outpatient programming, groups, neuropsychology, and behavioral health consultants that are embedded within primary care. So we have a broad range of skill and specialty um, with our providers, and we really wanna leverage that first. So when we're on the phone with the member, that's what we're trying to tease out. Are we going to be able to meet their needs? And if we can't meet their need, whether it's the time it takes to get them into the appointment, the culturally specific care or the specialty they're asking for, we do and we will um, issue the member referral to one of our many community affiliates. So I think it's important um, to call out, and I would be remiss if I didn't, is that the national place that COVID has put us in in this social isolation um, as part of a part of this pandemic um, really has lended to access constraints not just for Kaiser Permanente, so no excuses here on my side. Um, it is really a national um, struggle around supply and demand for uh, mental health services. So we do really lean heavily into our community affiliates when we can't meet the need inside. And so by definition, a community affiliate 
These are paneled and credentialed and contracted partners. So they fit into that in-network bubble that you see there. Um, they've been through a very rigorous process with us and do comply um, to all policies and paperwork, which often seems like a lot for them, but it's just so we ensure that the quality of care is um, what we expect inside our KT system. So thinking about that other bubble, that out of network bubble, because that often is on the mind and the radar of many folks. And one of the scenarios and many, if not an unusual one, is that a member of this new to KP makes a request to continue to see a provider that they that either has is not in our network bubble or um, is maybe that they've been seen and they didn't let KP know and now they're at a point where they're we want KP to pay for it. So there's a couple scenarios that happen there. Um, we do take um, these requests through a utilization management process. So this is where we're examining the type of licensure that the provider has and the type of care they're providing. Um, we do a needs assessment. So we look and say, in mental health and behavioral health, can the needs be met inside of KP? And if the answer is we can meet that inside of our in-network bubble, um, we will work with the member on transition sessions. So I don't want you to think that this is a hard and fast you can't see your provider anymore. We're not going to cover it. We're not going to take care of you. It is a process of where we reach out and we say, member, we're going to provide you. We can do these services in house. We want to bring you into one of our internal providers. We're going to give you typically it's 10 sessions that can be used over six months. Um, and we give them that the, since the date of authorization, and then they're able to continue to do those 10 sessions. Um, KP will cover those transition sessions and will bring them in house. Now, member can choose to stay out in the community. Um, and at that point, it is they are informed that it is at their expense um, at that point. Um, but we do sincerely try to work with the member to bring them to our in network bubble. Um, and also, we do have a contracting team that is constantly looking at our current contracts. Um, and reviewing for geographical needs um, as well as culturally specific needs. So I'm going to go ahead and spend just like two seconds longer on just a couple future states, Sapari, and then I'll hand off to Gwen. Um, our projects here, really, a lot of the work that we're doing in mental health and across the KP region, the voice behind it is always the member's voice. Um, we do have patient advisory advisory boards, and I sit on the mental health and addiction medicine patient advisory boards. And these are a diverse group of members helping leadership in the mental health team to identify gaps, test new theories and upcoming ideas and bring us um, the community voice. So that's been a really great way for us to leverage that. Um, we have been developing a population health dashboard. So this dashboard is gonna allow us to basically see where our membership exists in mental health um, and where it's like a heat map that shows us where we need to expand services or how services are being accessed. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, we are continuing to update provider um, profiles and biographies, and we're hoping by the end of this year that we'll have that all wrapped up and um, available to everyone in its finest form. And of course, um, the really most important thing is just right from the get-go is adopting that language in our triage process around prompting folks to what are the needs you have. Who are you looking for? What do they look like? And how can we help with that goodness of fit? Um, and so in closing, I'd just like to say KP Mental Health has come a long ways. I've been in my role for about a year now, um, or coming up on a year, I guess. Um, and I'm really excited about what we have for 2021. Um, is it, are, are we perfect? We're not perfect. Um, but we certainly are out there, and we're trying, and we're using the member's voice um, to, to make the improvements where we can. So, Sapari, I'll go ahead and hand back to you. Thanks, Michelle. Before we get to Gwen, any questions from board members at this point? Perfect. Okay. Gwen? Yes, good afternoon. <laughs> I am here to talk about provider diversity, and we're doing some really innovative um, things at um, Northwest Permanente, Kaiser Permanente, in order to diversify our employees, but also some things in order to really integrate diversity and inclusion and equity with the colleagues that we currently have. And so I'm going to talk to you today about a few things that we're working on, but there's so many others. 
um, I'm going to highlight some of the uh, some of the top things that we're doing in this space. Um, the first is around our current state. And we have a few programs around community as well as our recruitment pipeline. And as it relates to our recruitment pipeline um, and our community programs, we are working directly with two schools um, here in Portland, um, two middle schools, um, Fabian and Ron Russell, on cultivating the next generation of physicians. And as we do that, we have physicians, we have approximately 40 physicians that participate in this volunteer program where they go into the schools and they talk to students about becoming a physician. And it's a really great program. Um, what we found last year was that in one of the schools, we had 95% of the students that participated were female. And that's encouraging because we wanna make sure that we're cultivating gender diversity into the next generation of physicians. Um, so we're doing a lot in terms of really developing that pipeline and looking to how we encourage um, students as well as their parents to give them some incentive to explore STEM and to become um, physicians at some point. We also have a fantastic mentoring program with OHSU um, where we are partnering with them for a, mentoring pro, uh, for a mentoring program with their students. And we, we again, have about 40 students that have gone through um, the second cohort of our program at OHSU. And so we are continuing to build upon these pipeline programs that we're working on, because we know that in order to um, have a diverse pipeline of physicians that we can't wait until those physicians go to, go to college, right? We have to really look at um, developing them prior to that point. And that, that development really starts in middle school, right? When they start to have an interest in going to college and an interest in what they will potentially major in in college. So we wanna be right there supporting them. And many of our physicians have been really great supporting um, the, these programs. The other is around culturally responsive care and training for our current physicians. You know, I get all the time that we're not a very diverse organization, but what we're doing internally is, um, and what we're doing is we are working with our physicians to give them more information on how to be culturally responsive to a changing demographic, um, to a um, demographic that is becoming increasingly Hispanic and in, in our state. And so um, what we have is a collection of modules um, for our physicians. They're able to go through those modules self-paced um, and they focus on things like cross-cultural communication, uh, microaggression, unconscious bias, the history of discrimination in Oregon, um, interpreter services, when to bring in an interpreter um, for a patient. And so we have those modules and we have our physicians that are going through those modules, not as a response to compliance, but in response to the fact that we want to ensure that we're driving patient care. So that is first and foremost, that we're focused in on our patient and what our patients need. And our physicians um, need to be culturally responsive to our patients. And that's how we're doing it. Um, and I'm really happy to say that we're building upon those modules. We have several other um, modules that we are creating to respond to our physicians' needs because they have seen within the community that they need to have more information and more um, support in order to, uh, to, to support a broader community. The other is around um, the Kaiser Permanente Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine. And um, we launched the Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine named after our late CEO, um, in July, we accepted our first cohort, and this cohort um, of students is diverse, um, and that was intentional, right? We um, did everything that we could to go out to a broad range of uh, potential students, and a, a very diverse group of students were accepted into our first cohort for the School of Medicine. And, um, and so, the, the focus at the Bernard J. Tyson School of Medicine is really on becoming culturally responsive. Um, so our physicians, when they leave there, will be able to come into the Kaiser system 
and already have their education around being culturally responsible and responsive. Um, the next is our future state. And so our future state is to become a workforce that is reflective of our community. And we know that we have some work to do there. We're not, well, we're focusing on um, achieving strong recruitment efforts at historically black colleges and universities that have med schools. And we're also focusing on right here in Oregon, right here in Portland, um, focusing on the demographic here so that we can start to recruit from our backyard um, and really develop people that are currently here. And so we see a lot of great work that's happening in that space. And hopefully, you know, in another year, I'll be able to come to you and say that we have shifted and we do have um, more diversity within our physician ranks. Um, but that's the area where we're really focused right now. And so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Safari. Great, I will go ahead and take the next. Any questions before we move on? Okay. A, looks like there's a question. I don't have a question. I just have a comment that I was impressed with what you said. Uh, and in order to get diverse physicians of tomorrow, you need to start in middle school today. I have uh, a, a close friend who works in research development, Hewlett Packard, and uh, Google a few years back did a study of demographics of computer science um, employees and found it was white males and then uh, uh, Indian males and by India from India and then Chinese males and then the response in most industries including Hewlett Packard to that was to try to shift who they recruit and the reality right. is that, that would be massively ineffectual because you need to change who's getting the education at the earliest levels in order to affect the recruitment of tomorrow but that takes long term right. strategic planning so uh, I appreciate that that you all are working in not just the next few years but the next 15 years to affect that change. Yeah. Thank you for that comment. Yes, it, it, it's very important. Yes. Are there any other questions or comments? No, I plan to be out by tomorrow. Okay, then I will uh, spend a few minutes talking about our social care model. And this is a work in progress and very exciting work that is really encompassing all aspects of our organization with an efforts with to acknowledge really that what we've known for a long time is that how much of health outcomes, both health outcomes and disease outcomes are dependent on someone's the environment that somebody lives. That's a far better predictor of health outcomes than actual medical care. Though the money all gets spent on the medical care, um, the much of what's going on that need that leads to needing the identical care medical care relates to environments, access to food, access to transportation, uh, and financial uh, situations. Um, and recognize those create, you say transportation, that creates challenges in people's ability to get to work, adding hours a day that they can't otherwise take care of themselves or their families. Transportation can affect someone's ability to get to a medical office, ability to get to a pharmacy, uh, and so on. So these are all vitally important. And as we look at disparities in care and we look at our population in whole, um, the need for understanding the social factors that drive care and mitigating those as best possible, or being part of a collaboration to, uh, to meet those needs uh, ends up being critical. So for maybe the fast four, four to five years we've been working on this um, uh, involving hiring navigators that were typically primary care based or connected with a specific care management program uh, such as our uh, uh, transgender uh, gender pathways program. More recently it was finding the need for uh, helping people access uh, and get refer referrals and information back from social agencies. We piloted a program with Unitas, which is a national um, program involved in helping uh, governments, um, uh, local governments, helping uh, large companies, uh, and helping um, uh, health insurance partners identify needs uh, and then get people connected with needs. Because we have, because in our typical way, we add a lot of things into that. We call that thrive local. 
It was piloted in the Northwest region, was found to be very effective and useful, uh, and that actually got adopted last year uh, by Kaiser nationally as the platform for doing this work nationally. Exciting update this week is this platform that we use, Thrive or, or Unite Us, has been adopted uh, by the Oregon Healthcare Leadership Council uh, for the state of Oregon, and it's also being adopted simultaneously by multiple CCOs uh, and as well and Pacific Source um, uh, in Care Oregon as the technology platform to help uh, identify social needs, uh, tag them uh, wherever somebody finds assesses a need to be present uh, and then connect people up with up with that. So this infographic kind of goes through the process and it's not too surprising, but you can really see how it's light years ahead of the old way things were done with a bunch of post-its on a piece of paper uh, on a bulletin board identifying who the contact was at the food pantry, who the contact was for emergency transportation, a pharmacy contact that was willing to provide medications at low cost. So now this is a active on active database uh, with some specific uh, tags to connect. So first of all, first is identification, and this is can be in our system, uh, <clears throat> members who have social needs, whether it's housing and security, transportation issues, uh, financial stressors uh, can be um, identified really by anybody. That can happen through the medical record uh, for people who are clinical, uh, but can also happen uh, through member services, uh, through navigation programs, through our new member uh, desk department. All those people have access to Thrive Local uh, and can then essentially tag um, uh, needs to a member. Um, and if that's done within the medical record, uh, it's really a direct link to get to Thrive Local. At the same time, those V codes that indicate social needs can be appended to the chart uh, like another diagnosis code. Second part of this is connection, and that's really getting, keeping a active database of the local resources that is cross-referenced by type of need, whether it's legal services, uh, whether it's um, financial resources, housing resources, as well as as well as geolocation. Um, this can this program, the United's program or Thrive Local, is available at no cost for all of our partner um, social service agencies uh, to be running this platform at the same time. Uh, this keeps the database alive and active. Uh, and can be constantly be filtered, uh, sorted uh, as programs come and go. So then from that point, we're able to then provide the information, provide community resources um, to our members at the same time, place a referral uh, that lands on the desk uh, at one of our important partner organizations. Um, so they can actually then make the outreach and connect with it. This is all HIPAA compliant. All, the, all that detail, all that backend stuff has been done. Uh, and then finally, it's a closed loop, so that information then can come back. Did the referral happen? Was an appropriate referral? Uh, and then what actually happened? So all, each of these places, data is being collected, data can be tracked, uh, the system can be improved and can grow. And you can see it's useful for us to do this within the organization, but the more customers using this, the more entities uh, that have access to this program, the more effective it's going to be because the uh, the resources necessary for our members are exactly the same resources that as would be needed uh, for a Pacific Source member who's one of the um, uh, partners uh, in this Oregon statewide program using uh, Unite Us. Um, the other another aspect of this is using some is is working with our community partners. So this is just one example of working with Impact Northwest, uh, which is one of our partner organizations, and we in conjunction with them, have deployed new resource specialists. Um, they actually were going to be physically located at a few clinics, one in Salem, uh, one in East Portland, and one in Vancouver, but then COVID hit, so now they're all working online. But those are folks that um, uh, are experts at helping. They're non-clinical, but they are experts at community resources. They're all culturally um, uh, relevant and culturally identified uh, to help uh, um, from different communities uh, to help people access services uh, that they might need. And that's a place where we help, are working with partner organizations. And there's a, we have a few of those programs going on right now, um, but that's just one example uh, to do that. So that's kind of the model of it. The next slide kind of shows some back end, what that might look like uh, from the um, 
medical record perspective or from the person using uh, this uh, Unitas program. You can see the prompt there is for food insecurity um, and you can see the task that happens and then it gets logged in, gets clicked on and that way the data is captured uh, in an effective way. We know who's been referred to where. We also know which of those referrals were ultimately successful or not. Um, and that is a whole lot of work. There's more going on than that, but that kind of gives you a sense of how we're approaching this for our organization. Again, this is not just for commercial members. Uh, this is really for all our members, Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial members. We do find that although the proportion of people who need services are higher in Medicaid and Medicare, it's still more than 20% of our um, referrals for uh, navigation and for resources do come from our commercial members. So there is a, a large need there as well. Um, with that, I will take any questions and either questions about uh, what I just presented related to how we are um, working through social determinants of health uh, or any questions related to uh, provider diversity and training. Nice current commercial on TV. Do all your doctors have to sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? <laughs> uh, they try not to let me do that. Well, thank you. Appreciate you presenting this. Um, with that, we'll move on to Moda. Great. I'm going to go and share my screen now. All right, and let me know if you can see my screen. Got it. Great. All right, well, I'm. we're going to start off with Dr. Johnson. I'm not seeing it. You don't see it, Jeff? No, nope. I have it printed out in front of me, though. And Dr. Johnson? I see it, Erica. Great. And can you guys hear me OK? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you again for this opportunity for us to uh, present this afternoon. Um, I'll just uh, have some brief opening uh, comments and then I'll turn it back over to Erica. Um, in essence, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion are very key initiatives for MoDA. And we believe they're very critical, obviously, for the entire healthcare ecosystem. And why? Well, because embracing diversity in healthcare compels us to understand the larger context of race and culture, of gender and sexual orientation, of religious beliefs and socioeconomic realities, and also the relationship of all these variables to health outcomes. Consider the mosaic of ethnic origins and family structures and core belief systems, implicit biases, and a host of other culturally determined factors. These all dramatically impact the way in which people uh, experience illness, the way they adhere to medical advice and respond to treatment, uh, and such differences are real, and they directly propel differences in outcomes of care. At MOTA, we understand that the intentionality of programs and the full engagement of all parties uh, to the diversity um, uh, of our partners, the diversity of provider networks, uh, and through analysis of social determinants of health data, all have a profound impact on the health and well-being of our community. Uh, that's why uh, our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion starts at the highest level. Our board of directors has a standing diversity and inclusion committee. Uh, Kara Stoudemire Phillips, you will meet shortly, sits on that committee, as well as Robin Richardson. Uh, and speaking of Kara, uh, she has recently been promoted to vice president, and she now leads uh, our diversity, equity, and inclusion and community uh, initiatives. Um, and this uh, actually uh, is an indication of the commitment um, uh, from the top. And also, we believe that it's very critical for the success of any organization uh, moving forward. Uh, also, our newest member of our team is Astrid Sosa, our health equity administrator, uh, and she will spur the implementation of all of Moda Health's equity initiatives, both internally and externally, and team with our partners as well as our provider networks. Uh, as with any strategic initiative, uh, collecting and analyzing data is very critical. 
Uh, John Klaus, our uh, senior manager of data science, is laser focused on helping us understand the importance of collecting key data and specifically around social determinants of health and turning that information into intelligence that helps people live healthier lives. Uh, again, uh, this presentation that you'll hear this afternoon will hopefully bring all that together. Uh, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to ask. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Erica. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Um, and thank you again for letting us um, be here to talk about um, a subject that is really important to our organization and to serving our members. Um, here on the slide that I have up, um, these are the presenters that Dr. Johnson um, just described to you. And so I'm going to now kick it over to Karis to get us started. Good afternoon. Sure, sure. Let me see. <laughs> So I have the opportunity today to share with you about MOTA's diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. So I've been in MOTA for nine years, and I started with MOTA on our diversity, equity, and inclusion journey shortly after my start date. MOTA has always had a strong base of employees on all levels who are interested in how to establish a workplace built on strong principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the fundamental challenges of where and how to begin were present. Though not a formal DEI initiative was initially in place, independent DEI advances were being made in the areas of hiring and retention, training, customer service, marketing, corporate giving, and more. However, that all changed in 2016 with the birth of MOTA's Diversity Council. A small group of employees from varying levels in the company with leadership support agreed that the time was now to affirm and to exclaim MOTA's DEI commitment. As a founding member of MOTA's Diversity Council, myself and my colleagues committed to actively dedicating our time to formalize how we at MOTA celebrated diversity and created an inclusive workplace. The council both then and now is composed of MOTA employees from every level, top down and bottom up, meeting in the middle, with each possessing an equal seat at the table as a contributor to our collective advancement and success. Knowing the history of previous DEI initiatives at MOTA, the Diversity Council was adamant that it needed to be known and trusted by all that this initiative was not a fleeting moment, but a movement here to stay. In our evolution, we agreed that a big bang was needed. For the first time, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday was added to our company calendar as a paid holiday for all employees. It was important to not only offer the day off, but to also share with employees opportunities to truly commemorate and celebrate Dr. King and their local communities on the holiday. Our journey was emphasized with CEO Robert Godey stating to all employees in a video announcement about the holiday surrounded by Diversity Council members. He said, respecting others is foundational because it helps us all be better. It was then when employees clearly understood that MOTA's DEI journey had truly begun. Next, our Diversity Council began to build a roadmap, and this roadmap is what guides our collective work today. The keys to our roadmap include one, recruitment and retention. We must recognize and acknowledge diverse strategies to attract and to acquire diverse applicants, and then create mechanisms that motivate employees to remain at MOTA. Second, education and training of our employees, including both new hires and long established employees is essential. And our human resources training team has created over 25 DEI focused trainings from inclusive leadership to microaggressions. And third and important, business development. This includes, but is not limited to increasing our internal capacity to serve all of our customers through the creation of cultural, culturally specific marketing and increasing translation services and offerings, supplier diversity goals and criteria, strengthening our RFP process, and with this, our commitment to the staffing and budget, meet, and budget needs to meet our goals and priorities. As I reflect on MOTA's evolution, two key successes must be emphasized. First, 
our employee resource groups, and our second, our corporate social responsibility initiatives. I am deeply engaged with both and view each as shining examples of MODA walking our talk. When the Diversity Council was established, one of our first initiatives was establishing ERGs, employee resource groups. ERGs offer employees an opportunity to commune, engage, uplift, and learn. Our current ERGs include African American, Asian Pacific Islander, Latino, LBG, LBGTQIA+, Next Gen, Veterans, and Women in Leadership. Each group is open to any and all employees, and groups are invited to meet once a month for one hour on company time. ERGs at MODA present cultural celebrations to all employees, teaching heritage, featuring guest speakers at events, and representing MODA in the community, both volunteering and also attending MODA-sponsored events. MODA's corporate social responsibility impacts, impact includes three arms of giving, health, environment, and social equity. Our goal in social equity is to help to reduce health disparities and to facilitate, facilitate broader access to living well. We accomplish this by partnering with nonprofit organizations to assist underserved communities. Our nonprofit partners in the area of DEI are vast and we support communities of color, seniors, other abled, veterans, and the LBGTQIA plus communities through corporate giving, employee giving, and employee volunteerism. MODA is committed to our DE journey, DEI journey, and this is just not a journey. This, sorry, this is the, just that, a journey with no end date. The work evolves as we strive to be better. It is an evolution of growth, understanding, partnership, and a deep commitment to both heart and mind change. In my newly established role as Vice President of DEI and Community Initiatives, I will work with all parts of our business to generate, execute, and monitor initiatives to build a diverse workforce, meet the needs of a diverse client population, and manage our community investments and public profile to support building more inclusive communities across all of our service territories. In addition, I will also coordinate efforts with our partners like you all at OEB to ensure that our product offerings across all businesses meet the needs of a diverse customer population. MODA is committed and we will continue to strive to be better internally so that we can be better for and to our members and partners externally. I'll pass it to Erica now, and there's uh, unless there's any questions for me now. Great, thank you, Karis. Thank you. All right, and now I want to introduce you to Astrid Sosa, who is our new Health Equity Administrator. Astrid. Good afternoon, my name is Astrid Sosa, and I recently joined the MODA team as the uh, Health Equity Administrator in this newly established role. And in this role, as Dr. Johnson mentioned, I will be leading and facilitating the development and implementation of health equity efforts across uh, MODA, um, especially with um, you all um, and partnering with you all. And I will also be externally collaborating with our provider network and community partners to help reduce disparities and engage them in the work and initiatives that we have in mind and moving forward and just collaborate with you all and learn about specific needs of our uh, member base. Um, I will also be working internally with our MODA teams to identify and, and evaluate gaps and needs in care and develop and implement uh, plans to improve the quality of care, access to care, and our service to our members. Great. Thank you, Astrid. Um, I know we are excited to have Astrid on our team now, and we're also excited about Karis's new role and um, the work that we are going to be able to do as we move forward. Right, so I'm going to talk to you um, just a little bit about our provider diversity. Um, so currently members um, can use our find care tool, which is our online provider directory to be able to search for providers. And um, currently uh, members can view language and gender through find care. Um, and 
and, but they're not able to view uh, race, ethnicity, or specialized services for our, the majority of our providers. Um, however, for our behavioral health providers, we actually do collect this data and um, we keep this data in a database. So if members call into our health navigators um, with questions or looking for a specific provider that meets their needs, then our health navigators have a process in place to warmly transfer those members over to our internal behavioral health team and they can work with the member to be able to locate a provider that fits their needs. Um, we are actually doing a lot of work in this area and we have a project internally at Moda right now where we are um, going to be expanding, expanding the collection of the race, ethnicity, language, gender, and specialized care um, information on our providers and we'll be expanding that to all of our providers. Um, we are on track to have that information available in Find Care for members to view and search by quarter three. So around June of 2021. Um, for provider diversity um, out of network exceptions, um, we really, our goal here is to be able to find a provider to be able to fit um, the member's needs. So we really do whatever we can to be able to ensure that members have access to those providers. So right now we treat race race and ethnicity as um, sufficient justification to be able to make a network exception if we're not able to meet that need within our network. Um, so if a member um, notifies us of a provider or need that's not in network, then we will work to do a single case agreement with that provider. And then we'll also use that as an opportunity to recruit the provider into our network. And um, when we do receive um, uh, notifications like this or requests like this from our members, we actually use that um, and prioritize that recruitment so that we speed it up so that we make it um, so that we have the provider go through that process quicker so the member has access to the in-network provider as soon as they can. Um, but we will do a single case agreement with that provider that will allow the member to be able to see the provider at the in-network rate. Um, and as I had just said, our behavioral health team does have a process in place to be able to help members find those providers that they're looking for. Um, and then we use any request that a member gives us um, looking for a provider to fit their needs. We always, always use that as the opportunity to extend contracting offers to our members. Um, in the future, just as we begin to collect race, ethnicity and specialty services data for all of our providers, um, we will be able to really expand on being able to help members locate those providers, um, especially because they will be able to do that search themselves through our Find Care tool. Um, in terms of our network, um, we really don't have a lot of insight on the diversity of our providers today um, since we do not have information from all of our providers. Um, we do prioritize contracting with providers of different races and ethnicities, as well as those who indicate they provide services for people of color, um, LGBTQ plus services or speak additional languages. Um, and anytime a member notifies us about a gap in care, we always use that as a priority um, to contract with that provider. And um, we are always accepting contracting requests from providers who provide a diversity of services, so we are always accepting um, their applications. In the future, as we do begin collecting this data and making it searchable, we will be able to better ass um, assess the diversity of our provider networks. We'll have a better understanding of how diverse our provider networks are and the members that they're serving. And uh, we will continue to focus and prioritize diversity among um, all of our provider networks. I, any questions about um, provider diversity um, networks or out of network exceptions before we move on? Great, all right. Well, I'm gonna invite John Klaus down to come and talk about um, Moda Health Context. Thank you, Erica. So uh, I'll pivot from divider diversity, provider diversity to member diversity and talk about health context, which is our broader approach to social determinants of health with the, the primary goal of developing a holistic view of the person and not just the patient. So, so uh, health context is based on a, a, an understanding around the impact that social determinants of health have on healthcare outcomes. Uh, an inordinate uh, effect in, in particular, uh, some of these determinants like food insecurity, housing instability, transportation, uh, they, they, they affect healthcare outcomes, they add uh, 
unmanaged cost to the system and, and being able to identify where an intervention can be effective is, is largely not based just on the clinical information, but on this overall understanding of a person's circumstances. So if, if we go to the next slide, we'll look at, at, at how we've broadened the objectives for health context beyond that sort of initial population health perspective. Uh, and then focusing on the uh, ability to identify individual needs between visits and, and be able to align them with uh, the services that we could orchestrate through organizations like uh, Unite Us. Uh, these, these same measures of social determinants of health uh, allow us to evaluate the effectiveness of third party disease management solutions. So as we bring in telehealth or behavioral health chronic kidney disease, and, and in particular, uh, third-party management solutions for, for diabetes, understanding which solutions are effective. There, there are multiple vendors for uh, disease management, and uh, in, in diabetes in particular. Uh, they may work for, for different patients with, with different degrees of, of engagement, uh, different social circumstances, different abilities to adhere to medical advice. And, and these health context measures allow us to, to dive in and understand more innate performance characteristics from one vendor to, to another. And, and, and then we, we build these models where we can segment and risk stratify. So we understand uh, which members with a given chronic disease are, are, are more likely to, to need elevated levels of help and attention so that we can apply those scarce resources. And, and as we, as we talk about uh, our, our providers, the diversity and the needs of our members, uh, gaining deeper insights into health inequity is, is predicated on being able to understand uh, how each of those members are unique and, and how we can assess the, the application of healthcare and the availability of healthcare to each of those segments. And then further, as, as we're talking about this, being able to understand how the diversity of our population of members is mirrored in the diversity of our providers, again, all based on this, this broader health context. So if we, if we look at the next slide, we can, we can see a little bit beyond how uh, we, we take these goals and we start to get traction and, and, and put them in, into practice. So there are a number of sources of information for social determinants of health, but, but his, they all have pretty significant limitations. So, uh, the the clinical record has a as a, a record showing a Z code indicating uh, perhaps the presence of a particular socioeconomic challenge for for a patient, but they're they're very sparse in their use. Uh, there's publicly available data down to the census tract level even that, that indicates um, neighborhood norms for education, income, housing. Uh, and transportation. And, and, and these do well when we have questions that address a population of members, but they, they don't do well when trying to identify the needs of an individual. And, and we do collect demographic measures, but electronic medical records have not always been um, uh, rigorously maintained. Uh, identity measures like gender, pronoun, and sexuality uh, used to be missing in the medical record. Uh, organizations like EPIC have done a great job over the past several years to fully integrate uh, these, these into the, the medical record. But that data has been slow to propagate through to other parts of the, the healthcare um, ecosystem. And, and so as, as Dr. Johnson was mentioning in, in the opening, uh, things like faith, uh, the family situation, the, the presence of children and the number of parents, these all have uh, studied outcomes on, on, on healthcare issues and and we know that uh, there are certain healthcare flags that, that indicate uh, the challenges with adhering to medical advice or barriers to getting to primary care uh, to, to, to get that advice. So, so these measures uh, all add together to, to health context. Uh, there is one that stands above all the rest and that is a tool called PREPARE. Um, we can dive into the next slide. It's a kind of an unhandy acronym, but this is a survey developed by the National Association of Community Health Centers. And in fact, the Oregon Primary Care Association is one of the title sponsors for this. This this measure has uh, this this the system has been um, 
refined and tested and, and, and published in, in a number of different studies. And in fact, the, the core metrics of this have been incorporated into the top four electronic medical records. So Epic, McKesson, Cerner, uh, I believe eClinical clinical works. There's a number of them that have included uh, the prepare approach to, to tracking some of these measures like race, ethnicity, language spoken at home, um, and, and diving into the socioeconomic components. So we, we can see where there may be challenges with income or housing stability or food insecurity. And, and in this common format, we're starting to see information coalesce across different medical records, across different payer organizations. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is the model that, that we think will provide the greatest insights into, uh, into the social determinants of health that, that, that we, we've built uh, around. And, and it's collecting that data that, uh, that will allow us to, to really achieve those objectives we talked about initially. So I think if we head to the next slide. We're, we're there. Okay. So I, I think uh, just, just looking further at, at the opportunity uh, to partner together uh, to, 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 to leverage just an existing survey, an ex existing model, and, and, and go out and explain the, the merits of this, why this data helps our members, and, and how it allows us to fulfill our mission to, to make sure that we are addressing concerns around health and equity, and that we measure the diversity of our member base and the diversity of our providers in a, in a similar model to be able to, to show how we are, are making those improvements that, uh, that Karis and Astrid spoke of. So I'll return it back to Erica. Thank you, John. And you know, as John was talking about health context um, and the PREPARE assessment tool, um, we really believe that this information and having this information on our OEP members would be able, would help us to be able to serve them better. Um, especially um, as um, in the context of Moda 360 and having that 360 degree view of the member. And we would like to ask OEB to partner with us on this data collection effort. Um, and we would recommend um, discussing the prepare assessment tool and what we could do with that tool um, further in CIO. And so I would just open it up to any questions um, or conference um, comments or conversations about um, our health equity or the prepare assessment tool um, in general. This is Tom. Hello. I can hear you. Okay. Um, uh, Erica, my question mm -hmm. has to do with with information that Moda has in regards to be able to um, examine health disparities. So is that information, it sounds like with the prepare assessment tool, something you want to do, you don't have that information now. Yeah, and I'm actually going to ask John um, to help um, speak to that. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, from from a number of different sources. So our, our, our claims adjudication system, uh, some of the information we get exchanged from clinical records, the, the race, ethnicity, uh, sex, there are some measures of diversity. Uh, they are they're inconsistent across those different sources. Some of them are fairly sparse. Yeah. So one of the first things we, we dove into was was looking at the quality of the information we had. Uh, and then taking that and for uh, you leveraging it to the best of our ability to look into uh, where we can identify in inequities. And so uh, there's a gentleman, Bill Dwyer, and his team have been uh, continuing to evolve the view on, on that. Um, but, but my assertion is that um, given the challenge in, in front of our, our shared organizations, we need to expand this uh, health context idea and get a more rigorous set of, of source data to, to give a great answer to where where we're seeing health inequity. Yeah, and, um, and I would assume that um, you have pretty wide variation amongst your clinical partners in your network about what information they're collecting. 
Y yes, uh, that is uh, kind of the challenge where in, in the past, each organization has approached this individually and, and some of them, uh, uh, very little focus was, was, was given to it. Um, it is the advantage of a common model to, to be able to, if, if I could just take an example, uh, and we look at race, in some systems, race is a single choice. It's, it's black or uh, Native American. You, you don't have the option to say I could have, have multiple races. And so mm -hmm. each of these systems, if they collect it, they may collect it a different way. Uh, the advantage to taking a, a model like prepare is is that there's there's been analysis done on the the most contemporary way to define these measures and then record them in a way that's consistent across each of our groups yeah so the, uh, i guess uh, i think uh it may have been erica who ended up saying uh or that cl would be a place for us to to study this if we're going to be serious about health disparities we need to have our um, our health plans to be able to <coughs> essentially require their networks to be able to um, populate this type of information so we actually know. Um, at uh, the morning CL meeting, we heard from um, Kaiser Permanente that they are, one of their uh, incentive measures is around uh, addressing the disparity of diabetes control in uh, the Hispanic slash Latinx community. Uh, that type of, um, I know the governor uh, and OHA has been, the Oregon Health Policy Board is pushing very hard at addressing the issues of health equity and, and the disparities that exist. So, um, we will we'll follow up more with this issue at CIAO, but um, it does speak to even the fundamental contracting that you have with, with your providers to be able to say, it is our expectation by X date, I don't know what that right date is, that you are able to provide this type of information because it matters. So that, that's a, a, a comment and a suggestion uh, to add to your work plan that's probably about five pages long. That is a keen insight. I, I think that assertion from both the, the member and the provider perspective in order to address these concerns. Exactly. Uh, we've got to put this uh, sort of a, a, a data first component to this conversation. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Tom. Tom, Tom, if I could just offer a comment. This is Ali. Um, you know, health equity has really emerged in the health authority uh, over the last year as the priority, um, especially over the next 10 years in eradicating institutional bias and racism. And we're kind of uh, way ahead of ahead of uh, the state and, until COVID hit and everything got put on hold. But there's a tremendous effort to collect uh, real D uh, data across the state in a consistent manner. And uh, one of the reasons why we had the carriers come and talk today about um, social determinants and health equity is, um, for one thing, it's really encouraging to see our partners prioritizing these areas and and uh, data collection. And um, there obviously are health disparities in the state. And I really think it's important for the board to understand those disparities and um, one of the things that um, my own division and the health authority um, is working on is a framework for developing a health equity lens um, to apply to committee decisions or board decisions um, where you understand that um, the impact um, in uh, any decision um, as well as accountability um, for contracting and, and the work in general. So um, I would just like to put, pose it to the board, um, you know, um, to, to continue to bring um, information around uh, health equity um, and in the OEP board um, consider developing their own framework um, for, for an equity lens that, that aligns with the health policy um, division as well as uh, the PET board. And, you know, again, that, those discussions can be had in CL, but uh, I would just put it out there that this is a real priority and um, um, something
something that I think um, would be well worth the time. Yeah, let me just, I see uh, Sue has her, her hand up, but just to follow on that, and, and uh, the, um, uh, it, OEB and PEB is big enough to be able to say to its, its health plans and the health plans then subsequently saying, we need you to do this, to say, this is critical information by you know and it will give you time to build it but but you need to be able to report information so that we can then correlate um the issues around health disparities relating to the issues of race ethnicity and and other important social uh, social uh determinants and then I'll, i'm sorry i'll now be quiet um. Thank you. So, uh, Ali, I, I would say you know, kudos um, on, on two fronts. The first is relative to presentation today by both of our partners relative to the employees that we serve. And when I think about the work that school districts are doing intentionally relative to diversification of workforce, this looms large. Uh, and so having uh, being able to say that our benefits um, really does uh, understand and addresses the needs um, of a diverse workforce, I think, is is key. The second piece um, is writ larger uh, relative to OHA. And so any comments or, or support that you can give to the larger body of the state, again, as a superintendents and Bob, I see his, his hand was up. He may have something to add to this as well, I'm sure, uh, uh, relative to the new set of state metrics uh, for re-entry into schools. The things that at least I'm battling um, in my district is that my families of color, um, my, my BIPOC populations are saying uh, we are disproportionately hit uh, by COVID. We do not have access to care uh, as other populations do. Um, and we are fearful for our children. And so it creates an immediate inequity in terms of who may or may not feel safe enough to access um, health care um, while we're trying to navigate and provide for equity of instruction and rigor. Um, and so uh, that work writ large in terms of the larger needs of, of our state population besides those that are served by PEB and OEB, I think is worthy work. Um, and my last point would be any work uh, that this board does relative to applying an equity lens. Um, this is work that both Bob and I are, are intimately familiar with, with our own districts. Um, and it is something that is at the heart uh, of we operate um, in Tiger Tualatin. Um, and, uh, you know, it is, in fact, we actually have tents um, that sit on the dais. Uh, and now we have to have them virtually that speaks to um, the questions that help lead us through the decisions that we make um, and keep our eyes focused um, to, uh, to equity to ensure that whatever decision we are making um, takes that into account. Thank you so much. Bob. Uh, so I just comment similar to Sue's. Um, I sit on two other uh, health care boards with HealthShare and with Care Oregon. And I can tell you that both of those organizations have health equity at the top of their agendas too. It would seem that um, it would make a lot of sense. And, and maybe between OEB and PEB, we can help assist with this, that um, there should be some conversations going on across the state with all these different organizations that are attempting to, to make an impact to see if we can align efforts. Because um, uh, an alignment of effort could, could have a substantial difference for families. Uh, the other thing I would point out, and this goes to the Kaiser presentation um, regarding remote uh, mental health access. Uh, one thing that's, that we're finding with um, our populations that are less affluent is they're having a significant issue in actually accessing um, the care because of lack of um, device to get to the medical support, the mental health support that they need because uh, they can't, they can't uh, manage the uh, technology. Ali, were you looking to formally um, have a uh, work group established on this topic? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, we could we could have maybe two board members assigned in, more informally um, to to help look at um, agenda items and um, even pre-reading materials. Um, um, you know, the PEB, PEB board kind of started this in the summertime and have had a little bit of a head start. So, um, you know, I think we can um, cut out some of the some of the the lengthy uh, work that they had put in and um, and focus more on how the OEB board would like to to frame their policy around health equity and um, and the work of the board. Um, I, I just know how busy people are, and to create a, an entire new subcommittee uh, would probably be a, a, a pretty significant commitment. So while I'm open to that. I don't think it's totally necessary. So uh, what efforts by the state um, address Bob's concerns about kind of coordination across different organizations? Yeah, that's exactly what they're attempting to do within the Oregon Health Authority. Um, and, you know, right now we actually have um, three hour meetings once a week um, to um, to roll out a strategic plan statewide. And uh, we have pretty much every player in the room. Um, so I, I would expect to see um, um, that plan, um, you know, within the next couple months. And um, it, it's a huge, huge endeavor, um, but it's one that, that again, the, the health authority has been working on for over a year. And if it wasn't for COVID-19 completely um, enveloping their entire resource pool, um, that we would be um, out there front, in front of other states even. Okay. Is there anybody on the board that would be interested in participating? I would, Jeff. This is Suiki Smith. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments before we move on to our next agenda item? I just had a quick uh, comment on this subject. Uh, before we spend a lot of time as a board, I would want to make sure that we are not, uh, you know, spending hours creating a document that says we endorse advocacy, but we actually have no actionable function. Uh, quite often, uh, as a government employee, I found government loves to, you know, make mission statements and make action stuff, but they don't actually do things that affect substantive change. So I'm not interested in spending time doing something that isn't going to benefit directly people. It's just a nice fluffy thing to say. Um, but I think there's lots of things that we could do that would actually have substantive change. Um, so I just want to make sure that's our focus. Um, that and tie it in with what the state's doing so we don't do duplicative work. Good point, thank you, JJ. Okay. Ali, this this is Tom. I'm also interested in, in um, working on that group and providing uh, um, the medical perspective. Excellent, thank you so much. Good, thank you, Tom. Okay. Well, with that said, we'll we'll move on to uh, Willis Towers Watson for a presentation and several followed by Kaiser and Moda. So we've got three, and we're going to have to work to get back on schedule. But time's been well spent. Okay. So. This is Jenny, just checking that you can see the presentation that's up on my screen here. Yes. OK. I think with Teams, it's just a little bit tough to tell what's being presented. But it, at, uh, at any rate, thank you. And it's good to see many of your faces, even virtually. Um, so Ali and, <clears throat> and Jeff had asked us to put together just sort of a primer of various virtual health solutions, digital health solutions that are out in the market, what are employers thinking about? 
what's, you know, how is that landscape changing because of COVID? And what are some potential areas to consider just to complement what the carriers are doing? So we have um, a short discussion for you today. Really, this world is growing and has been before COVID. So we could spend quite some time talking about that, but I'll just give you a high level view of what's happening. We'll start with some survey data just about you know, the adoption of telehealth and digital solutions um, in the marketplace and what employers are thinking about. We will take a quick tour of the broad landscape of virtual um, or of various virtual and digital um, solutions. We're going to focus a little bit closer on two areas where employers um, tend to be focusing their time, and that is the be behavioral health um, area. Um, musculoskeletal and wellness. So actually three areas. Um, so here is just a quick um, survey data showing, you know, how popular telehealth solutions have become among employer sponsored plans. So this is really no surprise. The big, um, <clears throat> the big area to, to be aware of is that while employers have been offering telehealth solutions for several years, the actual adoption of them has been relatively low until um, COVID hit. And that's when um, members and employees are starting to use these services um, quite a bit more. In fact, here's a little data on OEB use. <clears throat> we will have um, much more information to share with you next month when we do kind of a larger COVID analysis. Um, and claims and utilization. But here's a quick stat just on pure telehealth use uh, within Moda and Kaiser. And they may also be providing some of this information to you as well in their presentation. But what you can really see here is, so the Moda utilization was relatively low until COVID and then, you know, healthcare doesn't stop and people still need care. And so there was a pretty huge spike in um, Moda members looking to access care in a different way. And then on Kaiser, there was just more telehealth utilization before COVID, but again, it did spike and increase significantly during the shutdown. Okay, so um, the areas, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit, the areas that employers are um, honing in on these digital solutions seems to be especially in the area of mental health and behavioral health, um, diabetes, and then as I mentioned, musculoskeletal, and then I don't think wellness um, is necessarily here because this is a more of a uh, condition list, but certainly that has been um, in the whole wellness sphere, digital solutions and um, apps and that kind of thing have been really popular. Jenny, uh, this is all like, could you expand the slide? Oh, so it's just pretty small. Thanks. How's that? Does that work? Um, no, it's still the same. Okay. Hmm. He means go into presentation mode. Oh, shoot. Now I have to be a PowerPoint expert on this, don't I? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> what? Uh, you go to slideshow, it'll say presentation. Where is that? I don't even see that. On that. Goes design, top scroll bar. Animation Oops, slideshow. up here. Nope. <clears throat> one, one level down. Slideshow right there. This says end slideshow for me. Uh, one level down. Uh, maybe there. Then say start slideshow from this slide. Sorry. <laughs> okay, it's not there. Right there. Is that it? I don't know. It doesn't want to do it that way. All right. Yep. <laughs> Is this better or was it was it better before? It looks the same, but it's OK. All right, well, we'll just slide those small. We'll just move on. Um, yeah. OK, well, let's just start here. This is the landscape of vendor solutions. Um, and I, this is just really a partial list. There are so many vendors out there. So hand in hand with digital and, and telehealth solutions is just pure point solutions. So over the past, uh, you know, 
five to seven years, there have been um, a plethora of new point solutions developed to help um, maybe bridge the gap in terms of what was being provided by traditional medical carriers, or maybe even just to complement them. So for example, um, Livongo is a diabetes um, solution. And while, um, and a lot of their care is delivered in an electronic format. So a lot of these solutions are trying to really um, help members get the right care or get the right information or help not, you know, steer them in a certain way. But most of these solutions are um, provided in a digital format or on an app or that kind of a thing. Or they want you to um, communicate with the vendor in a digital way. So this is, they're sort of hand in hand. But you can kind of see here the whole gamut of a variety of different things. Some of them focus on acute care, some on chronic Jenny, care. I, yeah. Jenny, I'm only seeing the your introductor introductory slide oh, mine no. has not okay. ed, has not continued down to where you are okay let me just see if i can get back out taylor are you offering to present for me yes i am would be great let's see Okay, we'll let, we'll let that, maybe that'll work out better. Then I won't have to focus on teams. Okay, let me just get this pulled up here. And I have like three screens, so it's like, it is showing up on my screen. <laughs> okay, how does that look? Great. Okay. We're on board. All right. Okay, keep going. One more. Okay, that's where I was. So again, this is just, oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, I just, on the previous slide, talked about the just the gamut of a variety of different telehealth or virtual solutions. Um, in this slide, we're just sort of talking about, you know, obviously OEB already has a number of um, telehealth and virtual solutions, and because Moda and Kaiser are going to be presenting next, I'll let them talk in more detail about what they're offering. OEB in general, on the left-hand side there, is also offering some other complementary programs through Canary Health, so the virtual lifestyle management, the better health, um, the better choices, better health. Weight Watchers, which does have an in-person um, component, but also a virtual component, and then Total Brain and Healthy Team, Healthy You, which is a worksite um, program, but also offers a digital platform for people to uh, participate as well. So some of the opportunities as we look at what is happening um, within the OWEB um, healthcare plan, that we may want to talk about, um, and we were talking about earlier. So this is in the area of mental health, musculoskeletal, and um, emotional well-being. At the down at the bottom, though, at the heart of all of these digital or telehealth solutions, um, it really depends on two things, and that is: do members know about the solution? So communication, making sure that they understand what's available to them, and not just at open enrollment time. It has to happen throughout the year and preferably having all the carriers um, pointing members to their available options. Um, and then you have to measure engagement. So that's those are the two things, communication and engagement. Um, we have, we'll talk towards the end um, a little bit about some ideas that OEB consider in terms of, um, you know, apps and virtual open enrollment solutions. Okay, let's, let's move next, let's move on. So in terms of behavioral health, you can move forward one more. Yeah, so just at the top there are some key metrics about OWEB um, utilization. You can see there the 21,000 OWEB, oop, go back. I'm on slide 10, yeah. So real quick, just, yeah, go back to slide 10. 
Taylor. Um, that's there you go. So you know the the important point is at the top, which is there's 21,000 OEB members who access mental health or substance abuse services through the medical plans in 2018-2019. Um, it mental health and substance abuse does represent about six percent of OEB's cost, so it really is something um, to focus on. And as we kind of heard through. Um, the CIAO meeting this morning, and then what uh, Moda and Kaiser were talking about in terms of access to care, that's a really um, key area and really one of the reasons why employers have been focusing on complementary um, telehealth or digital solutions to the medical carriers' uh, options. And it's because there's just a shortage of um, behavioral health providers, especially those who can prescribe medicines. And what's really happening um, more so now than ever before is that members are wanting to access services from a provider that they can identify with. So <clears throat> that, that might be a person of color, that might be someone who's, you know, their own gender or is very familiar with what they're trying to um, solve in the therapy. And, you know, if you already reduce the number of available folks who, um, so for example, example, if you're looking for a therapist of color, you know, already you've reduced the number of avail available therapists to choose from and they might not be close by and all that sort of thing. So what these virtual um, behavioral health solutions attempt to do is to make, you know, help you find a provider that you can identify with, do it quicker um, sometimes than what members can do in a traditional setting um, and provide some coaching in between sessions. So let's go to the next slide. Um, in that, in, I don't know if so on the next slide, I'm really having technical issues here. Um, so what you can see here is just a variety of different, you know, uh, vendors who play in this space. The ones that are circled, um, so Moda is working with Maru Health um, and Kaiser is working with my strength, and those are two uh, tend to focus a lot on that cognitive behavioral therapy uh, type of therapy. Um, but there are other vendors that play in this space on the right hand side. And I would say so Spring Health, Ginger, Lyra, Modern Health, what they attempt to do really is to, um, you know, it's a, it's a wider network of behavioral health providers, but also incorporate some of the EAP services um, and that on and then that ongoing coaching and personalized um, assistance. So just something to consider. I mean, the the Maru and my strength are just getting started, so it probably makes sense to just assess what's happening there and then um, look to improve and expand in the future. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so this is just the, you know, keys to um, how to make sure you have a successful solution in this space. And the number one thing that I mentioned before is communication often and through multiple channels. Um, efforts to remove the stigma for members in um, accessing resources. And this is where, you know, at the carrier, folk, things like the, um, the navigators um, can help to do that. Newsletters can help to do that. Entity communications can help to do that. Um, and then getting that coordinated approach, everyone's speaking the same language and pointing to the same resources. And then you need to measure, um, monitor, and refine your approach. So that's mental health. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so MSK solutions, so this is really an area, again, that had been growing prior to COVID and um, employers are really looking to um, a little bit closer at these because, you know, it's harder for members to go out and get um, services during this time. But what these digital musculoskeletal vendors do is for the most part, um, <clears throat> they're providing virtual physical therapy and coaching for things like hips, knees, soldier, uh, shoulders, back problems, 
as a first line of defense before the member starts talking to a surgeon about surgery. Um, just up at the top, you can see that, um, and you may remember that MSK does represent one of the largest areas of OEBS spend um, at 13%, and quite a few members do have claims. Now, some of those claims may be for things like sprains or strains, but um, a significant portion of OEB spend is in the area of um, joint replacements and back surgeries. So the rest of the slide is just a sampling of various vendors that work well in this space. Um, many of them are, you know, similar in that what they're really doing is offering that virtual physical therapy. Some of them even have, they will mail the member a tablet with the coaching on it, um, sensors so that they can put the sensors on, you know, what the area like in their knee that they're trying to work. And then the coach kind of helps and tells them whether they're doing the physical therapy correctly or how they can adjust. Um, one of the things about physical therapy that um, that comes up is that a lot of times members do get a prescription to go get physical therapy and they try it for a couple of times and then you know, just like any sort of, uh, it's like an exercise program, right? Like it's it's hard sometimes to keep up on it and do it every day. And so you find that um, sometimes members start forgetting to do the prescribed um, treatment. And so these kind of help keep the accountability going as well. Any questions about that? I'll stop for a second. Nope, okay. And Taylor, the next couple slides are just screenshots of various vendors' um, apps, so you can see. I'm not going to go through those. Jenny, I have a question on 14. Oh, sure. Um, so I'm wondering how some of these uh, charge. Uh, do they charge by an enrollee into the program or do they charge by the number of covered lives? Either or both. Yeah. Okay. Depends on how you contract with them. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, just a couple of comments about wellness. So again, wellness is a big area that employers have been focused on in general and many of the solutions offered to supplement what's what they're doing what the employers are doing on site happen to be digital or um, virtual in nature so um, when we think about wellness there's sort of four areas um, that frame um, a, a good well-being program and it's those that address the physical health emotional health financial health and social health. And so we just put on this slide a few of the, the different um, resources that OEB currently has to address these four quadrants. Um, you know, OEB is, you know, primarily makes uh, health and wellness programs available to members, but there's certainly a piece of that that lives with the entity since there's that employer employee relationship as well. So the goal is to help supplement those activities. I don't know if I'll go into a whole lot of detail here, but there's a few, um, you know, well, on the next slide, I guess I'll show you um, just a reminder about how OEB has been supporting all of these different areas um, with the new uh, website, the new retooled website, and the, we'll call it quarterly newsletter. It really comes out three times a year um, that focus on health and wellness resources and the goal is to provide members with information about how to access the wellness resources that speak speak to them um, either through the carrier or you know in the community in some cases this is just a snapshot of what OWEB's doing um, i did put a slide after this on um so if you go to the next slide taylor on some uh virtual physical fitness vendor so this is an area where employers are starting to say hey you know our employees are telling us that they can't get into the gyms but they still you know want something a little bit more formal than trying to again rely on their own um, motivation and so there have been 
some virtual um, online classes that are offered through a variety of different um, vendors. And so this is certainly something that OWEB could consider down the road. Okay. That's just, uh, I think this is the last slide maybe, but um, wanted to talk a little bit about, again, that communications piece. And so a couple of things that we have talked with OWEB about in the past is, um, you know, there's a website today where members can go um, to find solutions, but what is becoming much more prevalent is to build an app so that members have um, information about all the different resources available to them um, at their fingertips. So that's just certainly something to consider as an app that has, you know, the Kaiser information, the Moda information, the RBH information, um, and all the Weight Watchers and all the rest of it. And the other, the other item that we have talked with OEB about this past year, I don't know that there was time to really um, get it set up, is uh, is that virtual open enrollment um, platform. So a lot of employers used to do um, in-person uh, open enrollment fairs, um, but with COVID have really quickly turned to virtual ones. So it's essentially a website where members go to different rooms, virtual rooms, and learn about information about their program. So that's just something else to consider. So this is the last slide, and this talks about, you know, whichever solution you have, whether it's through a carrier or whether it's purchased on its own, um, kind of the the three areas um, to be mindful of is to do, you know, we recommend an independent review of what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to accomplish with the solution. Develop some sort of an ROI or value proposition on what you're trying to accomplish. Measure that as you go through, and certainly measure member engagement, which is the key to any of these solutions. Okay. Any questions? It was a lot to take in. No? Okay, thanks Taylor for driving. No problem. We turning this over to Kaiser or Moda? Sorry, I'm not trying to figure, trying out, to figure out, how out how to get it. <laughs> sure, we'll 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 take it. We'll take it. We'll we'll take the bait. Um, Thank you. Yeah. So very pleased to uh, have a presentation prepared today. Uh, looking at telehealth at Kaiser Permanente. I'm really pleased to have uh, Dr. George Go accompanying uh, Sapari and I today. He is our um, Director of Operations of uh, our virtual space uh, and really has a great deal of uh, interest and enthusiasm uh, and energy and expertise in how we integrate the various modalities to provide a great telehealth experience. I really kind of in preparing for this and having some conversations about it. I really think we are moving beyond, you know, we've been offering telehealth for a while, whether it's email consultations and telephone visits and more recently video visits. Um, but it's really how, which of those, what's the best way to take care of an individual or in their healthcare journey? It's really not about having telehealth as a, as a one, aspect of care that's kind of out there on its own. It's really saying for an individual's health problems, whether it's acute conditions or chronic conditions, what is the most effective set of modalities uh, to take care of that? Whether that's a face-to-face -face visit in the emergency room, a face-to-face -face visit in a clinic, emergency care, a telephone visit, a video visit, a virtual physical therapy session, a telehealth, mental health session, et cetera. So really what's, how do we most effectively get the people that get our members the care that they need in the most efficient way, uh, recognizing what's key is that all the parts have to integrate. So somebody who is following up from a face-to-face -face visit 
uh, with a phone visit has all that information available and has the whole patient's context there. So it's really beyond just these sort of independent sets of telehealth modalities, but rather integrating them, keeping the focus on the member and their concern, whether it's acute, chronic, uh, or wellness uh, that the member may present with. Um, so with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn that over to uh, George to uh, take us through this. Hi, Sorry, Hi. Sorry Hi. Dr. Hello, Rockman, Dr. Gopi. Before we start, can can you see the presentation? No. I'm not able to show it for some reason. I also don't appear to be showing up on video. I've been I'm not sure. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it looks like when I click, my photo is showing up. Can you hear me okay though? Yeah. Okay. Mm, all right. Well, um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, um, thank you, uh, Keith, for that introduction. Um, just to clarify, as the uh, Director of Operations uh, for Convenient Care, I do support telehealth, but um, the only two programs that I really directly support and have oversight of are two uh, standalone virtual uh, care option, e-visit, as well as uh, the recently uh, stood up video on demand program. Um, and I also support our call center and urgent care. So I have been involved with telehealth um, in the region for a, a significant number of years. So well, let's get started. So I, I appreciate the opportunity today to um, uh, go over what KP telehealth services are offered. And then uh, to uh, uh, earlier comments made by Keith, you know, what sets KP apart? I'm going to try and stay high level um, um, as we only have 20 minutes, I believe, and I'm, I'm hoping that um, uh, we'll have ample time to allow the uh, board members to ask questions. So let's go ahead. Um, can we go to slide number two? Yeah, it looks like Dr. Go, I'm trying to request um, to be able to share, but it's been denied oh. for some reason. So. <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I know that if we could just move to plan B, I think everyone has a copy of the presentation that was sent out. Maybe okay. um, we could just walk through it page by page. Is that okay, um, Jeff? Will that work? Yeah, that'd be great. And um, we need okay. you to move briskly. Okay, so slide two, um, you know, currently uh, KP members have access to the following range of telehealth care channels uh, through KP.org as well as our KP flagship app. So secure messaging, online care through e-visit, phone appointments as well as uh, video appointments. And then for those of you who may not be familiar with e-visit, um, it is a patient initiated online interview for common conditions to get care and advice from a physician in under 30 minutes. Um, we rolled out our current version a year and a half ago uh, after partnering with the uh, third party vendor, BrightMD. And um, we are on track, I believe today, to hit 100,000 patient initiated visits. Um, it is a substitute for secure messaging, uh, nurse advice, as well as uh, in-person visit. Um, for uh, appointment, for phone appointments, I added uh, uh, RTMC or the Regional Telephonic Medical Center to uh, provide some historical background and perspective. So our uh, RTMC was operationalized in 2008, and since then we haven't been providing what we what I would call now um, in the moment on demand um, phone appointments in support of nursing advice to you know to our members. We just didn't call it telehealth at that time, but we provide a lot of in the moment uh, escalated phone uh, visits to members. And then from, from, from that, we are able to actually provide about 15% um, of the time, you know, a resolution from those calls, avoiding an unnecessary ED visit. Um, in addition to uh, scheduled uh, clinic uh, video visits, we stood up our regional video on demand program in March as a response to uh, COVID. Um, and we are expanding this capability, uh, the service line by leveraging existing technology, um, utilizing what's called a tighter care device 
to include a physical exam during the uh, video visit. We have future plan as well to offer patient initiated video visit that sends a request to a uh, queue uh, with a short uh, wait time. Um, slide three, um, if you can just turn to that. Um, at KP, you know, um, our telehealth offerings is not only provided by primary care, um, but pretty much um, all of the service lines are uh, included. Um, that means pediatrics, ob uh, pretty much all of our medical as well as uh, specialty care service lines, mental health as well as addiction medicine. And then included in that are urgent care and emergency physicians also participate through our regional video on demand and our TMC programs. Um, so telehealth is all hands on deck for uh, KP. Uh, slide four with the our integrated care delivery model, you know, we believe that our members get a better, more enhanced experience with care provided by KP clinicians practicing permanent day medicine. Um, and it's not just really about the visit, it's the program that we are building around it to support our members as well as our care teams uh, conducting a telehealth visit. I think that's really what sets, sets us apart from other health systems. Um, Keith, you want to, I'll turn it over to you to go over the time. Yeah, uh, slides five through eight just gives OM specific data and really focuses on what happened over the last eight months uh, with COVID. On slide five, on the left-hand side of it, you can really see the overall pattern there with reduction of uh, utilization uh, in April uh, and then moving towards, but not quite getting back to normal. That's kind of the height of the top bars. Looking down below that, you can see in blue that's face to face visits, which really went down markedly uh, in April and May and are, are now have up to about double the rate, but are still half of what they were uh, ba back in last January and February. You can see stability of the green bar above that, uh, which accounts for both coded telephone visit visits, which are uh, formal telephone appointments as well as unscheduled uh, telephone visit uh, as uh, some physician involvement with it. Above that is a small orange bar and you can see that mostly in March, but you can, it actually goes across and that is our e-visits, which is the algorithmic primary care visit uh, that's been very popular and became very popular in March uh, with lots of uh, upper respiratory infection symptoms and cough symptoms that people were concerned about COVID and found to be very effective in doing that. Um, about one out of 10 of those visits now are for mental health and anxiety concerns. They do a very nice electronic uh, but probing uh, consultation related to somebody's um, mental health symptoms. Again, with follow up uh, with a human uh, physician. And the top part there in red is video visits. And you can see how that really did increase three or fourfold uh, from baseline uh, during COVID. The right hand set of graphs there just compares OEP to Book of Business. And you can see that they're really pretty much identical. We did note a very slight increased overall uh, increased use of video care among OEP compared to Book of Business. But basically the trends are fairly similar. Next slide, slide six breaks up primary care and specialty care, and you can see slight differences there um, because of the nature of specialty care in certain departments. Um, the amount of face to face specialty care uh, is generally higher than it's been uh, for primary care. Um, things like dermatology really do require face to face visits for biopsies and things like that. Um, uh, but they're also in markedly increasing the use of video care, which you see there uh, in the top red bar. And that's been consistently much higher than previous uh, as we've gone from April to August. Um, slide seven gives detail on behavioral health. Same phenomena with markedly increased video care and telephonic care. Uh, we recognize that there are less and less, but there are some people uh, who can't access video care. Video care can be accessed either through the Kaiser, uh, the KP.org app on your phone uh, or through a webcam. Uh, but for people who choose not to use that uh, or don't have access to that, then any phone call uh, is an option as well. We really don't want to see the availability of video technology be a barrier for anybody to access care. For individuals uh, who who use languages other than English, there is um, uh, 
uh, interpretive services available um, and can be used with phone care, video care, or face-to-face -face care. Moving to slide eight. Um, uh, that's just kind of a summary of the slides above, uh, looking at comparing January to August uh, in primary care with the left two boxes, uh, specialty care with the middle two boxes, uh, and then behavioral care with the right two boxes. Um, so that's summary. That kind of gives you a profile of what's been happening uh, with telehealth and virtual care and casual permanente over the past eight months of the pandemic. Luckily, we had all these services ready to deploy, so it was really very easy for us just to change a few slight protocols and scheduling uh, and I'll be able to offer this. Our goal going forward, uh, and this will, this is subject to change as the pandemic changes, is aiming for 50, per six, 50 to 60 percent of our care face-to-face, uh, -face, so still a substantial amount of telephonic and virtual care. If the pandemic surges again, uh, we can adjust those numbers uh, for less face-to-face -face care if necessary. I'll turn it back to George on slide nine, the future of telehealth at Kaiser Permanente. Yeah, so the future of telehealth at KP is really now. Um, so um, going to slide 10, um, just some examples of how we leverage telehealth to expand access by streamlining efficiency. So one example is FastPass, which allows our members to receive notification uh, via text or email to fill short notice appointments due to cancellation or you know, additional uh, visits that are open. And then beyond Telestroke in the emergency department, we are leveraging technology to provide specialty care consult, not only in the uh, inpatient setting, uh, but also in our MOB, especially down in Eugene, uh, providing access uh, to specialty care um, and accelerating uh, 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 care for, for members. And then the one thing I really, uh, the one program I, I think it's worth really spending a little bit more time on is KP Hospital at Home. Um, so, you know, what is KP Hospital at Home? You know, think, think of KP Hospital at Home as the third metro hospital for KP, a med surge level hospital without a PCU or ICU. It's um, an acute hospital uh, substitution model and through our partnership with uh, Medically Home, we basically bring the hospital to the member's home, um, a uh, temporary virtual med search unit, you know, with the latest high tech hospital care is installed in the comfort of a member's home. And then a technology kit is provided with remote patient monitoring and on demand access 24 seven to the care team that is led by a permanent day physician. So um, every service, uh, traditionally provided in a patient um, um, med in a uh, uh, to a patient in a uh, med search unit like IV medications, labs, imaging, uh, in person assessment, you know, in person rehab in the patient's home uh, can be provided um, through this program. Um, with the COVID pandemic, we were actually uh, able to roll this program out and started out with the uh, diagnosis that we felt can be safely um, included. Um, and these conditions include early pneumonia, asthma, COPD exacerbation, cellulitis, and for members with established heart failure who um, decompensated due to volume overload, needing diuresis, those are the group of members that um, have done pretty well in this program. To date, we have enrolled over 170 members with no adverse outcome, and we have greater patient satisfaction, uh, lower complication rate, uh, less ED bounce back as well as readmission. And the other thing that's been nice is with you know um, a um, uh, shortage in um, uh, beds, um, it has allowed us to uh, increase our capacity and access um, with the ability to bring um, or repatriate members back to our uh, system that uh, wants to be taken care of by us, you know, receiving permanent day medicine. Um, and then the last slide, uh, and then I'll open it up for hopefully some questions. Um, the, the last slide, I just briefly want to uh, touch on uh, the uh, digital platform. There are five focus uh, areas for 2020 and 2021 designed to uh, empower our members to take control of their health. 
Um, the first one, um, <coughs> modernizing our uh, platform is well underway. Um, the second one, leveraging AI um, to power uh, digital care navigation, allowing our members to navigate uh, to the appropriate level of care options. I'm very, very excited about. Um, I think, you know, with a few questions, uh, it would it will actually guide a member to uh, the uh, appropriate channel, um, providing a recommended option as well as uh, offering additional um, options to uh, receive care. And then uh, in closing, and then I'll open it up for questions, um, you know, at KP, we are really committed to uh, telehealth care that is safe, timely, efficient, equitable, effective as well as patient-centered. Um, as mentioned earlier by, by uh, Keith, you know, we have set a lofty goal of 60% virtual that we know this is attainable because of our recent experience with COVID during the surge. Uh, we will make it work. Uh, we're committed to uh, make the intersect, inter, interaction human and uh, care coordination seamless. We are committing a lot of resources and building the infrastructure now uh, to provide the uh, support for our members and our care team to make it happen. So with that, I, I hope there's questions um, for the board for us to answer. Any any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, this is a question about slide uh, six showing the utilization rate for primary and specialty care. And it just, to me, it looks like those numbers are low. And I'm wondering if if that's what, I can't remember what, what they were in the past under normal conditions. So are these still pretty low for folks reaching out for specialty and primary care? Or would you say these are, these are back to normal numbers? Yeah, the, I mean, the January, February pre, was all pre-pandemic, so those were just reflecting what was going on there. There wasn't anything unusual last January and February that would make it low or high. So we could certainly provide the numbers further back. So I would say, in specialty care, the total numbers are up, though, with an increased uh, increased number of vi video compared to face-to-face -face visits, um, but still predominantly face-to-face -face visits. And primary care, some more even distribution of uh, video versus um uh, phone versus face-to-face uh, -face visits. And we are bringing, we are actively sort of outreaching this point of primary care for people with chronic conditions, just to make sure that those conditions are getting managed. It's sort of a funny time right now with, I don't know, 25% of people who are just kind of ready to get back to normal and a little bit frustrated that they can't see their doctor in their usual way always, or it's a little bit delayed. Another 25% of people who really are very COVID conscious and safe and do not want to come in. And then some people who are in the middle and understand it's important to come in to get those labs or, or have a visit if needed, um, but are also happy to do virtual or pleased if they can do virtual because it's more convenient and safer. So it's kind of a funny time. Does that help, Reid? Okay, we're going to take a break right now so that we can attend to some technical difficulties. So 10 minutes and hope that staff is able to work out our technical issues. Does anybody see anything now? No, uh, just the videos. No. No. Just, the camera. just the cameras. Yeah. I think somebody took over as host of the meeting by accident. <laughs> Um, okay, hold on one second. Nothing? Nope. I, I don't see what you guys see, so I need you to tell me. Just, just, uh, just the video see. cameras. Just the gallery. It's called gallery mode. Uh, now okay. we see somebody's uh, file file manager. File manager. File is the list really? of all the files in a directory. Yeah. That's weird. Okay, hang on a second. Rose, this is Cindy. Are you? We're seeing your desktop, I think. Now we see your desktop. Yes, you are. Your, I'm trying to share. Ah. Okay. That's you're sharing your desktop. Working. Yeah. <laughs> 
And you just blew up, you just expanded your agenda. Is it moving? And uh, now we'll. Yep, you're good. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Looks good. I don't know why Sapari wasn't able to share hers. She said okay, it, so told her it was denied. I didn't deny we it. Think I, we think it's just Sapari. Trying to get. <laughs> I did try to get Sorry, access, okay. but it said your, your access was denied, so. <laughs> I'll see if I can fix that, Sapari. I don't know where to fix it, but I'll see if I can fix it. Yeah. So Thanks, where girl. are we now? Maybe because where she lives in we, Portland. Where should we be? You mean on the slides, Rose? Yeah, where should we be? Um, who? Who comes up next? Okay, so there's Moda. We just we just did Kaiser, and Kaiser is going through right now. So probably see the whole point of this is so I don't have to do this. <laughs> I know you won't. You didn't earlier. That's the weird thing. I know that's the weird thing. Okay. See, I don't so, see what you guys see. All I see is my screen, so I don't know what you guys are looking at. We are looking at the Kaiser presentation right now, and you're scrolling and it's just through it. Zipping through it. Okay. So okay, this should be, right. Okay. That should be where we are. But whether or not okay. they can show it without you is a whole other question. All right. Well, if they can, if he can share his screen, then fine, I can take this down. And I think once he shares the screen, it bumps me off. Okay. Anyway, this is so much fun, I'm telling you. I know, but it will be great when it works. Yes, let me see if I can fix what's the problem with Sopari. <laughs> Yeah, hey, this is Bill Clay from Moda. I've got my presentation queued up, so I'm ready to share the screen, and so you won't have to. It'll kick you off of there. Okay, so if you share yours, it'll kick me off. Yep. Okay, give that a shot. <laughs> there it is. We can see it though. Sounds good, Bill. Okay. Perfect. So, uh, should we, um, should I uh, get going or do you want to continue with a little bit? Oh, of no, let him come back from break. Okay. That's you, right, Bill, not me. Something just took over the screen. Somebody, they show on their email now, their email calendar. The calendars. Yeah, now there. it's back. Yeah. Okay. If everybody's available, we can start it start up. I guess it's like asking who's not available. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Safari. It doesn't you don't look any different than anybody else does. I'm not sure what happened, Rose. <sighs> well, maybe we're back on track. Hope so, yeah. Looks like it. All right, I'm muting myself now. Bye. Thanks, Rose. Okay, let's Let's go ahead and get started. Very good. So this is Bill Dwyer, Director of Analytics at Moda, and Erica Hedberg is also joining me for this brief presentation. Um, I'll cover the first few slides that just mainly have data on where we are, 
And then Erica has a couple additional slides at the end talking about um, a new program and then uh, some things about where we're going. So I will just launch right into it here. And um, just uh, briefly, just say some uh, notes about these slides. I've got here data that's paid, that's uh, claims paid through September 30th. Um, but just to, as a warning, the last couple of months are a bit incomplete, especially the last one. Um, so as you see, uh, these are slides on utilization. Just keep in mind that the last month is going to end up being a little bit higher. Um, so anyway, we'll just go right into it here. So primary care, office visits, and telehealth. What you're seeing here is a chart showing the total utilization in claims per thousand of last year compared to this year. So last year is the gray line and this year is the yellow line. And then making up the yellow line is the, the blue and the sort of plum colored line, which are the standard visits and the telehealth visits. So sort of the sum of the of the blue and the and the plum colored equals the yellow. And so you can see that um, that regular office visits, face to face office visits, you know, plummeted in April. Um, there was a significant increase in telehealth visits to make up some of that, but still you can see that the yellow line was significantly below the gray line, meaning this year was well below last year in terms of utilization. And yet um, toward the, the summer, you can see that it almost caught up. Um, it looked like it was on a pace to sort of catch up, but um, that hasn't quite happened and we're still a few percentage points below where we were last year on an ongoing basis. Um, and then again, like I mentioned, the, that last point there is um, is sort of artificially low because we just don't have all the claims in just yet. We'll go to the next one. So this is specialist office visits. And by specialist here, we just mean in the office visits that are not the primary care office visits. And similar pattern. Um, as you know, what, what you've seen before, the office visits really took a nosedive in April. Um, and the telehealth increased substantially. And the telehealth for specialist office visits, um, you know, has, has continued uh, along. We're seeing a, just a significantly higher level of those than in the past. A lot of our providers, like you've also heard, underwent Herculean efforts to get technology online that enabled them to deliver the care in the telehealth setting and they've continued to use that. And just the convenience of that has led members to continue to utilize that pattern. Um, case in point, I'm certainly an example where you know I've just taken advantage of my provider's telehealth um, capabilities, which really did not exist before the pandemic, and it's just super convenient. So, um, so that's what we see with telehealth. So a similar pattern to primary care, it's, it's, it's almost recovered, but maybe sort of to a somewhat lesser extent than the primary care. We're still seeing that that's um, a little bit below uh, where we were last year in terms of utilization. Now this slide is our category that we call other primary care. So these are all services delivered by PCPs, but they're things that, that aren't readily, um, can't readily be delivered via telehealth. It's uh, screenings, immunizations, contraceptives. Uh, some of those, like some certain mental health screenings and things can be delivered by telehealth, but the telehealth line is so small that basically it's not even really there. And you can kind of see that there was a pretty significant drop in April like the other two with a pretty significant rebound uh, in June, which is which is very encouraging news. This this is out of all of the services. This looked like it rebounded the, um, the almost the most up to previous levels. But uh, and again, the, the 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 last line there is likely to come higher as more claims run out come in, comes in. But just um, the you know the point that I would make about this is a caution that yes, although uh, we're very close to where we were at last year at this time that just still means that there is a pretty big gap of services that were not delivered um, when they should have been in April and May. And things like immunizations and contraceptives and, and other screenings that it's going to be hard to, um, we're definitely going to see that in the quality measure performance um, because it looks like, I mean, we would need, we would need the yellow line to be well above the gray line in order to, to make all of that up. Um, and it just does not quite look like it's happening. 
And then uh, lastly, just on the um, behavioral health, this one looks quite different. And this is also that, uh, something that you've seen from some of the other presenters in that the telehealth visits for behavioral health have, uh, mm -hmm. have increased substantially and have stayed quite high, I think, as people discover the convenience of that channel. And that particular therapy really lends itself to a telehealth format. And so we're seeing you know, something like 70% of visits uh, delivered via telehealth, and, and it's continued that way, even as telehealth for specialists and, and primary care has gone back <coughs> down, um, but behavioral health has stayed quite high. If there's no other questions about the data, I'm going to turn the, this over to Erica, who's going to talk a little bit about Cirrus MD and some of the things that we're going to go uh, that, that we're going to do going forward. So here, we'll turn it over to Erica. Thank you, Bill. Um, so as you guys are um, probably aware, um, we just rolled out Cirrus MD to OWEB members, effective 10-1. And um, just as a reminder, Cirrus MD is a um, virtual um, telehealth. Um, members can initiate a conversation with a provider via chat, um, and they can do that 24 hours a day, seven days a week um, from anywhere within the United States. And um, it, that conversation starts out as a chat, but then can be elevated to a video call um, or pictures or to a phone call. So it's really um, being able to meet members where they are. Um, and members are also able to have conversations that um, span out over time. Um, so members, if they're engaging with a provider, they can leave that conversation, teach a class, do whatever they need to attend to, and then come back and engage in that conversation. Um, so I was able to pull just some very preliminary um, utilization data on Cirrus. Um, this did just start 10-1, and so this information is through 10-26, um, but we've had since then um, 34 uh, web members register for Cirrus, um, and 26 unique members who utilized it with 33 total member visits so far. And I wanted to share just a member testimonial um, that was provided from Cirrus. This is from our OWEB member. Um, and they said that they truly appreciated the quick and no hassle access to a doctor who seemed to truly care about helping them. Um, it was Friday and they were really worried about their son um, and there was no way that they were able to get him into an appointment. So she, this member thought that they'd have to take their son to urgent care, but they actually ended up calling a health navigator at Moda um, and it was the health navigator who suggested that they try Cirrus MD. Um, so the member did do that, and it looks like they had a really great exp experience with, with the new tool. So I just wanted to share that feedback that we've already received on Cirrus. Um, I also wanted to just show, oh, Bill, can you take me to the next slide? Thanks. Um, and, and again, this is just very preliminary, but it is really interesting to see where the utilization of Cirrus has been over this first month. and. Um, the as it gets green is where you have more utilization. But as you can see, we're having quite a bit of utilization in um, Central Oregon, um, then also towards the southern coast and then out near um, the Hermiston area. So it looks like um, members um, in areas that may not have um, close access to an urgent care are using the service. Um, it could also be that districts in those areas are promoting the service more to their members. Um, so they're just more aware of the service as well. Um, and we w we are sending out um, a communication to all OWEB members here this week. So members will be receiving a direct mailer that um, just discusses the health navigators um, and then also discusses the new point solutions we just added, which Cirrus is one of them. Um, so that's going out to all members and then we will be following up with that communication um, to all of the entities, letting them know um, that we're sending it out to their members as well. So um, expecting more members to become aware of Cirrus and expecting utilization to continue to increase in that. Um, next slide. So just really quickly, um, looking forward on telehealth, um, we do continue to support our providers in providing virtual care for our members. As Bill discussed, um, when COVID hit, um, a lot of providers really switched over to being able to provide virtual care for their members, and um, we continue to support them in doing that. Um, also, as a reminder, um, Maru, just launched 10-1 for OWEP members, and this is a behavioral health app um, that includes a 12-week virtual program for members to be able to address stress, anxiety, and burnout. 
Um, we are, I don't have utilization numbers quite on that, but um, I have heard from Maru that they have um, seen a lot of enrollment from OEB members so far. So um, excited to see how OEB members are engaging with that. Um, we also launched Livongo, um, which is a digital diabetes support. Um, and this includes a free smart meter and testing supply. Um, so we're starting to um, work on getting OEB members enrolled into that program. And then we do continue to evaluate digital solutions for chronic conditions as we move forward. All right, so any questions about um, Cirrus um, or any of the other point solutions that, that I just discussed? Great, well, thank you very much. Thank you. I guess I need to get closer here. OK, since we've taken our break, we have a couple of updates. Tom, you're up for CL. Am I muted? I think I'm good now. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, um, so we um, CL reviewed two of the uh, programs that have been in place now for almost a decade. Um, and I've talked with you a little bit about them before. The first one is the reference pricing program, which involved total joints, bariatric surgery, and oral appliances, where a set amount of money was uh, would be paid to the hospital for uh, one of those one of those procedures, and um, if the uh, patient went to a place that didn't go along with the reference pricing, they could be billed for the additional amount. Um, what um, uh, what we were not sure of was what was happening in regards to the communication to both patients and the providers when a non-reference priced hospital setting was chosen. And Moda gave us that, uh, uh, talked to us about that. And uh, both from Moda's standpoint and OAB administration standpoint, there really are no issues and no complaints about that. The uh, efficacy of the reference pricing program um, is a little uncertain at this point because so many other things have kind of intervened, including first it was the Summit Synergy uh, program, and then it was the impact of the 200% of Medicare uh, maximum for billings for hospitals. So, uh, but the CL recommendation is that we continue with the reference pricing and we will watch it over time. The other uh, update we had was in regards to the uh, ACT, which is the additional cost tier program where certain conditions that were thought to be um, member uh, preference sensitive uh, were charged extra amounts pay. That would be like spine surgery or hip replacement where the member paid an additional $500 or advanced imaging like CT or MRI, which would be an additional $100. Uh, what, we, uh, what our consultants gave us was an additional year's update, um, and they continue to show the same trend. Uh, after the first year of implementation of the, of the additional cost here, there was a significant drop in utilization. And then since that time, the changes have been sustained. They haven't gone up, they haven't gone down. Except, you know, there's some, there's like 10 or 12 different procedures that are included in this, and there was a little bit of variation. But in general, the OEB PM PM is about a percent lower than the book, uh, Moda's book of business. Uh, and the recommendation is that we continue um, with the ACT also. So that was the, uh, the two updates that we had. Um, we then heard from both KP and Moda on their incentive programs. The um, uh, KP is a, uh, their physicians are salaried and they have an incentive program that relates to uh, quality metrics and financial outcomes and member 
service uh, metrics that represent anywhere from one to five percent of total compensation. What was interesting in this was one of those metrics they have is uh, they've they've learned that there's a gap between how um, non-Hispanics are doing in regards to diabetes outcomes versus the Hispanic slash Latinx population. And so there are incentives for the medical group to be able to figure out ways to get um, to, to lower that gap. So this was an example that CIA was uh, very interested in in regards to understanding how one deals, how uh, uh, delivery systems deal with, with health disparities. And we're going to look into that to a greater degree over time. Um, MODA uh, gave us uh, a description of what happened with their summit synergy um, in terms of, um, of uh, quality bonuses, uh, withholds, um, money going to primary care versus special care versus hospitals versus drugs. Uh, the important thing is that that system is now gone and um, the new coordinated care model is in place as of October 1 of this year. Um, what was interesting that I found, two things that I think are important for the board to know. One, with the summit synergy, the low risk people became part of that, um, of that group um, who were using the summit synergy, the quote, co coordinated care. What you want, of course, is the people who have the higher needs, uh, the higher risk scores as such, to be part of that uh, coordinated care effort. And uh, the good news is with the, as they look at the new system, the average risk score uh, where it was lower in the Summit Synergy product, it's now actually higher in the CCM. Um, the other part, uh, other concern is that when you have risk payments that are going to individuals based on quality metrics, there's an inherent, um, there's an inherent bias for providers to try to avoid the complicated, difficult patients because they're harder to get under control and to reach that quality metric. Um, so the good news is that with CCM, they have a risk adjustment that actually is, um, is so that uh, providers who go at, who take care of the high risk patients actually are not penalized. And in fact, they're uh, taking care of the complex patient in an in a appropriate and cost-efficient manner. There's actually an increased potential for gain. The, the last topic that we spend an hour on, and Jeff, I don't know if you want me to try to get into it, was a description of something called the Lodestar um, um, project. And it is something that... Uh, comes to us from the innovation work group. We heard from consultants with um, uh, Mercer who have been working with the innovation work group on that. And I can spend anywhere from no time to a half an hour talking about it. So what would you like me to do? I would like you to pivot to the innovation work group report. Okay, so I'm not on the innovation work, uh, the innovation work group, so I can just be quiet. Thank you, Tom. JJ, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, kind of quickly go over what we what we did at the last innovation work group. We we started off by really talking about Senate Bill 889, and the specific thing we discussed was the role and implementation and value of value based payment models, um, and then how that's going to look within the structure of Senate Bill 889, some of the challenges and, and, and metrics that, that are gonna be used to implement that. Um, and really the purpose of looking at, although we are not really um, working to implement 889, um, there's a lot of overlap between what we're trying to do within OEB and PEB and the state committee is doing. So we looked at how um, uh, payment, uh, value-based payment models are gonna look with them. Uh, and then we, then we started talking about Lodestar and the, the genesis of this and it's been brought to the board I think once or twice was just if if we are going to hit the, the really tough target of 
and we want to change the structure of healthcare. What potentially could it look like? And over the last few months, we've really fleshed out um, kind of four pillars of what the structure would look like. And the first pillar is uh, sort of an advocacy-based uh, member support uh, structure. And then uh, the second pillar is link the payments to something that makes sense. And what we thought makes sense was Medicare payments so that the uh, payment model was, you know, based on something that was, was concrete and that we could, whether it's 100% of Medicare or 200% of Medicare, something that is based in, in, in a, a solid place. It's not just arbitrary. Uh, third was uh, base payments based upon quality metrics. And then lastly, having a global budget um, that affects, you know, we're going to set a budget of 3.4% and have a global budget uh, that can be adjusted to maintain that that uh, that that metric to hit. Um, so that we kind of flesh those out a little bit, and then the next step is uh, we're going to be releasing uh, a request for information for the market to say, hey, this is what we would like to potentially do. Market, what do you think? Do you have? Could you have the ability to implement that? So. We're not even ready for an RFP yet. We were ready. We just want to start with an RFI to see, you know, what options are out there, who, what vendors, and what, you know, uh, capabilities are there to implement that type of a structure. Um, so we can go into greater detail what it looks like, and that'll be coming in the weeks, weeks and months to come. But um, the hope is to get some good information back from the market to say, could this be a possibility? Is it something that the market can support? Uh, and if so, we can move forward and, and restructure how we have healthcare delivery. Uh, after we, after talking about Lodestar, we also talked about centers of excellence, and we determined that the best place to start is with uh, musculoskeletal. And uh, you know, after talking about why and the cost benefits of doing that, uh, we really determined that we also need to do a request for information under that um, in order to flesh out what is capable and then look at the different potential vendors we could use to help funnel uh, our um, folks to centers of excellence dealing with musculoskeletal. Well, that, that's all I have. Okay, if I might add a couple of embellishments there. Um, Lodestar is really a framework um, of looking at things and makes for a good um, paradigm for evaluating future developments. Um, it seeks to integrate uh, satisfaction and quality so that it addresses <clears throat> or has opportunities to address uh, diversity in that approach. And um, there, there's a nuance there in that um, the slide talks about rationalized Medicare linked payment, which is the second pillar. And the concern has already come up is, well, we're not really seeking to have a, a variant on Medicare, but the issue is that Medicare has the largest database for us to evaluate costs. So that gives us a good reference foundation, but we're not in to become a Medicare plan. Um, for that. So um, going forward, this gives us some benchmarks and uh, milestones to measure against. And so um, we've looked at it in Innovation Workgroup and we're in, intrigued with the whole paradigm. We looked at it again in CL this morning, making it more applicable to OEB. And we want to um, continue the discussion on that. Ali, did you have anything else to add since uh, you've been involved in all these discussions? No, I mean, like I think you and JJ summarized it well. I mean, <clears throat> I think the, the way I like to talk about it in high level terms is just it really takes all the legal directives that we're under um, um, and puts them under one model. And that's, you know, the 200% hospital cap, uh, the 3.4%, annual uh, trend cap, the 70% uh, value-based payment alignment uh, that the boards have signed up for, and uh, as well as the 12% expenditures on primary care um, payments, and then aligned with uh, quality metrics and um, 
It takes them all, takes all those and puts them under uh, one model um, along with a member advocacy solution and really taking that to the next level, even beyond where uh, Moda and Kaiser uh, currently have their member advocacy programs and, um, and aspire to get to. So I think that's about it. We keep reaching forward. That's right. Okay. Uh, any questions before I move on? Just being mindful of the clock. Yeah, I, this is Tom. I had one question. Um, has the innovation work group, when they talk about um, centers of excellence, have they talked about the difference between between PEB and OEB with, with OEB using fully uh, insured um, uh, health plans? And, you know, it, so in other words, OEB isn't make isn't going to be making any contracts with anyone. Our health plans are the ones that do that. Uh, and I, I'm just interested in in whether or not the innovation work group has had that conversation. Um, specific, go ahead. Oh, I I was just going to say not not yet, Tom. I I think COE uh, Centers of Excellence was kind of. Really, uh, we just landed on that as kind of the next uh, topic to prioritize on the work plan. We had about three or four different ways to go, and and uh, we did look at COE um, back before COVID nineteen hit, and uh, but it was mostly around the uh, variation in costs um, for services um, in different hospitals uh, around the state. So, um, I, I think, but looking at the viability is probably the next step. Thank you. We also looked at um, if we're going to do centers of excellence, what types of procedures should we focus on? And that's that's kind of what the discussion during the last meeting was. And that's why we kind of focused in on um, musculoskeletal, not the, the greatest return on investment by focusing on those. But the details of how it works has come to, is going to be in the weeks and months to come. And we already do have a limited centers of excellence benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, last meeting we were discussing um, the hospital cap rules and it was pretty unanimous that none of us are experts in that field. And so we invited the carriers to come in and uh, illuminate on what that means to them doing their job. And so uh, we invited both Kaiser and Moda to um, give us a uh, primer and some uh, enlightenment as to how um, it affects our uh, coverage going forward. So I think we have uh, Willis Towers Watson first. Jenny and Brad. Yeah. Hey, this this is Brad. I can, you know, we don't have any prepared materials, and I my headset just started beeping, so who knows what will really happen here. But um, I'll try and go pretty quick. So we did reach out to both carriers for kind of uh, year-to-date experience under 1067. Now that we've had, you know, a, a full plan year, um, we requested both the actual cost as adjudicated under the current uh, administration of the 1067 rules. Uh, we looked for the cost under the prior facility contracts, i.e. what would costs have looked like had this not gone into effect? And we also asked for costs that uh, under uh, the clarified rules and kind of we wanted to see what would happen in there. So Moda has provided this data um, currently for the first nine months of the plan year. Um, so 10-1 through 6-30. Uh, Kaiser will be providing this data over the next two or three weeks. And you know, in general, for the first um, nine months of the of the plan year, uh, Moda was estimating or had calculated that the impact of those clarified rules would, in fact, be between um, you know seven and maybe seven and a half million somewhere in that neighborhood. I know they'll be commenting a little bit more on that. Um, so we're uh, planning to do a full assessment once the uh, rest of the plan year has been. Um, run out so we typically need uh, around three months of run out data before we can really do that kind of analysis uh, and then uh, we'll also be looking at the Kaiser 
uh, information and they're able to provide that as well. So, so far it does look like that the impact of those clarified rules um, are in fact, you know, pretty significant um, and would involve, you know, up to close to a 2% impact on um, premium costs. So with that, I will turn it over to, it looks like uh, Kaiser. Unless there's uh -huh. questions. Okay, so hi, my name is Becky Williams. Um, nice to meet you. Thank you for the opportunity to come speak with you today and a, and a few familiar faces on the phone I see as well. So um, so just, you know, I thought we would kind of start with just noting um, a couple different things. You know, as Kaiser, we're in a bit of a unique situation in terms of our integrated delivery model where, you know, we both provide the care, but we're also working with some of our external provider partners. So we're in an interesting position to see kind of, you know, how we think about that in terms the changes and rules in terms of affordability, but also how it's impacting other external providers. So we're going to provide a, a couple comments on both of those fronts today. So obviously, you know, as Kaiser, we, we strongly support any, any provisions that really um, help with the affordability of care in our community. Um, what we are seeing is with um, some of our external partners, and as we're contracting with them, that certainly this um, the hospital caps as well as lesser of language is um, actually providing some savings. So I think you you know we'll probably see that in, in our data as well as we implement that. You know within our own delivery systems, that's kind of part and parcel of what we already do, and we have built that into our claims adjudication of systems, you know, really our focus is managing a bit more on the total cost of care, but we, we do support those efforts in terms of the lesser of. Um, you know, a couple things that we are starting to see in terms of just market reaction um, that we're beginning to see is we do think that some of the lesser of language over time may be a somewhat short duration um, in that hospital providers may be um, implementing targeted increases in their bill charges that may reduce the value of that over time. So that's one thing I think we'll all, all need to be looking at um, over time. I think one of the other things that we are seeing is that with some of these decreases, especially some of our external hospital providers are being a little less willing to contemplate more of value-based um, arrangements or payments because they are kind of feeling the squeeze up front. And then we are starting to see some upward pressure on some of our contract negotiations with those changes as well. But, you know, our message to many of the hospital systems has been continued, right? We internally um, understand our role in having to hold down our costs, our internal costs, right, for the market and encouraging them to do so as well. So just wanted, you know, to kind of provide that context. We are starting to see, you know, some reactions to that, but do feel that these, you know, these types of measures are part of the total picture of how we encourage affordability in the community. Um, I do think that we are hoping to see kind of as a next evolution, more of that focus on value-based care, as well as I think that I jumped on a couple of minutes early to uh, make sure I was here. And you know, some of the efforts around the 3.4% cost growth, we do think that those will be a little bit more holistic measures um, Consider as you know, we continue to evolve the affordability actions in the community. And I do have my colleague um, Bill Ely with me, who is heads up our actuarial team. So, Bill, I did just want to check in with you. Is there anything that you would add um, to my comments? No, I think you covered that great, Becky. I mean, I, I think you hit the key point, which is you know the the bigger long term picture is. You know, how do we value and encourage the value based payments uh, for our external contracted providers? So thoughts or thoughts or questions? Anybody? OK, Moda. Good afternoon, this is Craig Anderson. I'm going to uh, provide Moda's comments. Uh, I'm a senior vice president here at Moda and the chief actuary. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to talk to you about the revised hospital cap rules 
and uh, I'm going to limit my comments to just a couple aspects of the proposed changes. And I'm going to comment on both the, the financial impact and the member impact this has for OM. I also want to point out that my comments are consistent with the input we provided to the board for the 2020 2021 renewal process. And as Brad mentioned earlier, just as a point of reference, uh, we did estimate the revised rules would have a 2% premium impact for the 2020 21 motor renewal. And if the um, proposed rules are not adopted, uh, we anticipate that this will will increase uh, the projected renewal by 2%, which is going to make it more difficult for OEB to meet the 3.4% renewal target for the 2021-2022 um, renewal. Just I wanted to point that out. Uh, the, the two aspects, one is the uh, lesser of language. And um, just as um, some background, CMS for Medicare, fee for service, traditional Medicare fee for service, pays uh, the same rate regardless of what is billed. So what that means is that if a provider bills less than what Medicare pays under traditional fee for service, uh, CMS will pay that amount um, even if it's above the billed amount. Uh, but in contrast, commercial contracts typically include uh, the lesser of language. So if a bill charge comes in less than the contracted rate, a commercial carrier will reimburse at the bill charge. So what the proposed rules do is it clarifies the intent of the law uh, and makes it so that the 200% is the maximum amount and not the floor. Uh, and it does that by stating that the actual reimbursement amount for each claim shall be based on the lesser of bill charges. So that's pretty clear in that rule. Uh, this, not, as I mentioned before, this not only has a financial impact on OEA, but it also has an equally important impact on members. Um, when you're capping a bill charges, uh, like uh, uh, we do under commercial con contracts, that means that um, the, regardless of the build amount, uh, there will, you know, regardless of the build amount, uh, we might reimburse uh, a higher amount if that's what's allowed by by uh, Medicare. So um, what this can mean is that uh, the build amount at 200% of Medicare can be significantly higher uh, than what the provider actually charges. So this impacts a member when you're looking at the coinsurance that the member pays because the coinsurance could be based on the 200% of Medicare uh, which results in a higher cost share to the member if it's above uh, the build amount that the provider is charging. And in some instances, the member's cost sharing is more than the build amount, resulting in members paying more in out-of-pocket costs than what was billed. So we actually have some examples of this. Um, there, we picked a particular claim where the build amount was $3,200. Um, while the total amount allowed at 200% of Medicare was $14,000. Now, granted, this is a bit of an extreme example, but that is because it's 200% of Medicare, uh, that's what they would have allowed as $1,400 or $14,000. So since if we're paying at the 200% of Medicare, this resulted in a member coinsurance of $3,600, which actually exceeded the build amount. So that's that's affecting the member, and we wanted to make sure we pointed that out. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the additional concern is what may happen with the uh, upcoming renewal. And as I mentioned before, the 2021 premiums for OEB were set assuming that the claims would cap at the build charges and the impact on the renewal for capping a build. Uh, as Brad said, this, the, the total rules are worth about 2% to the pre premium. Uh, the capping a build is worth 1.6% of that 2%. So it is by, by far the, the larger impact. And as Brad mentioned, Moda did uh, submit actual claims for the last contract year under uh, 1067 and those uh, savings estimates are holding based on actual claims. 
So not capping at the build charges will add an additional 1.6% to the 2021-2022 OEB renewal on top of the trend, which will make it difficult for OEB to meet the 3.4% growth target. Uh, there's just a quickly a second aspect of the clarified rules that we wanted to point out, and it has to do with uh, applying all the Medicare guidelines in billing. Uh, in the revised rules, it states that all rebates, incentives, or adjustments that would have applied if reimbursed by Medicare would also apply. Uh, however, what we've seen is that some billing practices required by Medicare are not being followed by all hospitals, and that jeopardizes our ability to comply with this rule. Uh, the example that we've provided in the past has to do uh, with uh, something called a JG modifier that's used for outpatient pharmacy claims that qualify under the 340B program. So we have provided some updated language and suggestions uh, to to highlight that providers must submit claims as if they were billing for Medicare, including all of the CMS required modifiers um, to make sure that that happens. In the case of the JG modifier, the absence of this um, billing practice causes some outpatient pharmacy claims to price higher than the 200% of Medicare. Uh, this additional specificity in how the administrative rules uh, are applied uh, will ensure that the Medicare guidelines are followed. So um, this includes the, the uh, JG modifier. And we've estimated the impact of this to be about 0.4% of the 2% overall financial impact um, due to these temporary rules being adopted. Craig, um, yes. I'm not sure everybody knows what a 340B plan is. Okay. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm not exactly the expert, but I, as I understand it, um, some hospitals are able to um, purchase certain drugs at a significant discount due to this program called the uh, 340B. And um, Medicare has acknowledged that through the use of the modifier, which reduces their reimbursement um, because they are able to get these uh, um, drugs at a, reversed, re, a reduced rate, uh, but that's not, uh, we don't know exactly which drugs qualify for which hospitals. So it does require that the bill comes in with this modifier for the carrier to make that determination. It's not an absolute. So without applying that modifier, uh, theoretically the hospitals are taking, are, are um, able to access the drugs at a lower reimbursement but we're not able to capture that on how we reimburse the claims, so we are actually paying higher than the 200% of Medicare. Thank you. Yeah. So is everybody feeling like they're better educated now? Or... Okay. Ali, do we have an action item on this? No, no. Um, really, the public comment process is open, so we'll take comments from carriers as well as other stakeholders and bring that, that information back to the board and, um, you know, distill it and make it, you know, as understandable as possible and um, move forward. Any other comments or questions? Well, let's move on to other business or public comment. Okay, now, no, excuse me. Are, are there any? Oh, hell's gonna break loose in six minutes. Oh. <laughs> yes, you're right. Okay, so that you can tune into your preferred station, I will adjourn the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Take care. Be safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you.